This is ChestertonRadio.com. Lives of Great Men, a new series on great leaders in human progress, presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, distinguished lecturer, critic, and author of Beauty in Nature and Art, and many other books. In these talks, Dr. Griggs is building a story of civilization based on outstanding characters through the ages and how each one influences his own in future times. This evening, Dr. Griggs will discuss Jefferson, philosopher of democracy. We present Edward Howard Griggs. My friends, the careers of Jefferson and Hamilton centered in the making of our government, and in them appears that first cleavage of political philosophy which divided our country for many decades and culminated in the Civil War. Jefferson's Welsh-descended father was of great physical vigor and liberal mind. Though dying when Jefferson was but 14, he was the first strong influence determining his son's lifelong liberalism in politics and religion. Contrasting with several of our greatest men, Jefferson had thorough schooling. At 17, he entered William and Mary College, the mother of so many important leaders, and proved equally capable in languages, mathematics, and science, becoming eventually the most broadly cultivated of all the fathers of our country. Soon after entering college, he was honored by the invitation to be the fourth in a group of eminent men who dined together several times a week, including Governor Faulkner, Dr. Small, the foremost liberal scholar in Virginia, and wife, leader of the bar. Their conversation was of high value in Jefferson's education, and Dr. Small became the second strong influence confirming his liberalism. Leaving college at 19, Jefferson studied law five years with wife and began practice with immediate success. Through seven years at the law, he doubled his inherited fortune. Six of those years he served in the Virginia Assembly. His personal life was established by his marriage with the lovely young widow Martha Skelton, gifted in music, to which he also was devoted. Soon after his wedding, he drove with his bride a hundred miles west to the home he had begun building two years before at Monticello. The little mountain rises 600 feet above the countryside with marvelous views across the rolling hills to the majestic Blue Ridge. Jefferson was his own architect, constructing the mansion on classic lines, Doric columns rising at full height. Jefferson's marriage was exceptionally happy during the 10 years of his wife's life Only two daughters of his six children grew up to maturity, the elder becoming the mother of 11 children. It is interesting that the father's chief anxiety was to have his daughters acquire the manners and culture of gentlewomen. The great Democrat was distinctly an aristocrat in personal life. Monticello, remote from the settled part of Virginia, was even more than Mount Vernon, a little world to itself. All the bricks for the mansion were made by slaves on the estate. Jefferson brought better breeds of animals from Europe, introduced rice culture in the South, practiced rotation of crops, a great advance in farming. Though owning slaves, Jefferson was bitterly opposed to slavery, saying of it, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated but with his wrath? Indeed, I tremble for my country, when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. The death of Jefferson's father-in-law brought him 40,000 more acres of land with 135 slaves, again doubling his property. This was not an unmixed blessing, as there was a heavy mortgage, which in the end Jefferson paid several times over, collecting the money in our depreciated currency and paying it in gold at London. Jefferson was a delegate to the Second Continental Congress, And in May 1776, Virginia passed resolutions of independence, sending a copy to the Congress asking that it take similar action. Jefferson was appointed on the committee and requested by the other members to draw up the declaration. He spent 18 days at the task. His draft, accepted by the committee, was bitterly attacked in Congress, but with some changes was finally adopted and signed traditionally on July 4th. Jefferson thus became the author of the birth charter of our nation. It is now the fashion among smart cynics to call the Declaration of Independence a tissue of glittering generalities. Rightly understood, that is just what it is, a fabric of shining general truths, 
the only basis on which men can widely unite. Had Jefferson done nothing else than write the Declaration, his fame as philosopher of democracy would have been amply warranted. In the autumn of 1776, Congress asked Jefferson to go to France with Franklin, but his wife's illness caused his return home. Elected to the legislature, he was appointed to revise the Virginia Statutes. That work was of supreme importance, not only to Virginia, but for the nation. He succeeded quickly in eliminating the laws entailing estates on eldest sons, thus ending the development of a Virginia landed aristocracy. Gradually, he substituted the just and liberal penal system for the barbaric one then in force. His bills provided for a complete state system of education and for the elimination of slavery. Of these measures, he achieved only the prohibition of further importation of slaves into Virginia and the later founding of the university. The most important item, won through a 10 years fight, was the abrogation of the vicious colonial laws on religion, replacing them with his great statute on religious freedom, which reads, be it therefore enacted by the General Assembly that no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship place or ministry whatsoever, nor shall be enforced, restrained, molested, or burdened in his body or goods, nor shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief, but that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion, and that the same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil capacities. That is not the earliest statute on religious freedom in our country, but is one of the noblest, and through Jefferson's prestige and influence, helped to give us the similar guarantee in those first amendments to the Constitution forming our Bill of Rights. Jefferson thus became the father of American religious freedom. And in a day such as this, with worldwide revival of religious intolerance and persecution, we need, as never before, to return to his great ideas and follow them. In the darkest period of the war, Jefferson served two terms as governor when Virginia was ravaged by British troops. He narrowly escaped capture at Monticello, fleeing by an underground passage as the British came over the brow of the hill. Elected to Congress, Jefferson drafted the law for the government of the Northwest Territory, providing in it that slavery should cease there from the beginning of 1800. Finally adopted by the Congress, this made Union victory possible in the Civil War. His original bill further provided that slavery should cease in the Southwest Territory at the same date. This Congress rejected. Had it carried, there would have been no Civil War. In 1784, Jefferson was again asked to go to France. His wife had died in the meantime, and he accepted, soon succeeding Franklin as ambassador. His five years in Paris were happy. His culture made him welcome at the court of the last King Louis, but alone among our statesmen, he was able to see the true meaning of the French Revolution. Shortly after the fall of the Bastille, he came home, permanently loving France, but wholeheartedly American. He remarked to Monroe that to love one's own country, one should live abroad a while, advice as good today as when Jefferson gave it. Reluctantly, he accepted appointment as Secretary of State in the first cabinet, but was increasingly alarmed at the growing power of the federal government fostered by Hamilton with Washington's sanction. Jefferson believed in the least central government consistent with law and order. Hamilton wanted the strongest government consistent with liberty. At the close of 1793, Jefferson resigned and went home to Monticello. In 1796, the largest electoral vote was for John Adams for president, the next for Jefferson. As the Constitution then provided, this made Jefferson vice president. During his term, he devoted himself to organizing the opposition to the Federalist policies, thus founding the first political party to be consciously formed. He called it Republican, in contrast to the monarchial, as he stigmatized the Federalists. It was afterwards named Republican-Democratic and finally Democratic. It has had the longest life of any political party in America, and although called dying some years ago, recently took office with the largest majority given in decades. During Adams' administration, there was threat of war with France, and the Federalists passed the vicious alien and sedition laws. Jefferson wrote protesting resolutions passed by the Kentucky legislature, denying the right of the federal government to assume any power not specifically given it in the Constitution, and affirming the right of each state, 
on its own initiative to nullify such action. While needed at the time, those resolutions contained germs of grave trouble to develop later into the Civil War. In 1800, the electoral vote was equally divided between Jefferson and Aaron Burr, throwing the election into the Federalist House. As chief opposition leader, Jefferson was bitterly hated, and the House inclined to give the election to Burr, which would have been a national calamity. At this point, Hamilton intervened. Distrusting Burr and recognizing Jefferson's devotion to the country's welfare, he influenced enough votes to make his enemy, Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States. Jefferson's inaugural address was a masterpiece, stating his whole philosophy of democracy. He pardoned all sedition law convicts, gradually removed the midnight judges, last-minute appointees of Adams, and sought to eliminate all aristocratic customs. His great achievement was the Louisiana Purchase. The year he took office, Spain ceded to Napoleon her claim to that empire extending from New Orleans to the Pacific Northwest. When Jefferson learned of this, he exclaimed, we must marry ourselves to the British nation and fleet. He hoped, however, to buy New Orleans and some adjacent territory, an idea earlier urged, and sent Monroe to negotiate. Napoleon had not been able to shake the dominance of the British fleet and finally offered to sell the whole territory to Jefferson for $16 million. For that sum of national small change, Jefferson bought the empire that made our greater America. He did it in direct violation of his expressed views of the constitutional powers of the federal government. Taking as president, the action he saw was necessary to the nation's welfare. His second election was almost unanimous, but the party split behind its leaders, as usually follows when a party takes office with too large a majority. Believing no generation should limit a subsequent one, Jefferson was anxious to pay off the national debt before leaving office. To accomplish that, he must avoid war and so accepted grave humiliation to maintain peace at any price. He refused a third term, establishing the tradition founded by Washington, and left office saddened, but with the heart of the people still with him. His later life was given to the 16 years' fight to establish the University of Virginia. He planned its simple but beautiful buildings, and as rector inaugurated educational reforms carried out nearly a century later in northern institutions. In the last year, Jefferson suffered increasing financial distress, from a combination of causes, including the throng of visitors who came. He had to sell his beloved library, collected through 60 years. To keep the books together, he let Congress have it for about half its public auction value. A large gift from friends in other states enabled him to remain at Monticello. After his death, his daughter had to leave, and the great estate was sold for $10,000. So Jefferson died at Monticello. And strange to say, on July 4th, 1826, anniversary of the signing of his draft of the nation's birth charter. Stranger yet, John Adams died the same day in Massachusetts. And almost his last words were, Thomas Jefferson still survives. But Jefferson had died several hours earlier. He wrote his own epitaph, which reads, Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the American Declaration of Independence, of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. No mention of his other great services. Those were the three by which he wished to be remembered. Author of the American Declaration of Independence, philosopher of democracy for all time. Of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, father of our American religious liberty. And father of the University of Virginia, first of our statesmen to recognize fully the responsibility of the state for the education of the citizen under democracy. Jefferson thus stands for a few great simple ideas freedom of speech and press, freedom in religion, freedom of person and conduct, ideas for which we must ever fight to keep the soul of democracy in our great, ever-growing, more powerful and centralized republic. Jefferson, philosopher of democracy, has been the subject of another program in the series titled Lives of Great Men, presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Come in. Welcome. Welcome to the Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. In the assessment of criminality, 
The basic criterion, of course, must be volume. After all, Attila the Hun was a greater transgressor than, well, say, Jack the Ripper. Therefore, what does history tell us? We see that for those who kill more or less at retail, we have our local police. For those who murder at wholesale, the Attilas, the Hitlers, and the like, we must have our philosophers. Men who inspire us to stand up and fight. And such a fighting philosopher was Thomas Jefferson. Now, Mr. Jefferson, there's no need getting excited. Sheriff, they're going out there to commit cold-blooded murder. Well, that can't be proved. They intend to kill him. But there's nothing I can do about it. You swore to uphold the law. Well, not exactly. What I swore was to uphold the law to the best of my ability. And this, well, this just happens to be the very best I can do. Well, someone has to stop them. I don't have the authority to keep men from riding through the woods. Even if their purpose is to kill an innocent man? But I don't know that. I do. And if you won't stop them, I will. Now, Mr. Jefferson, it could be dangerous. Somebody has to enforce the law, Sheriff. And it looks as if it'll have to be me. Me alone. All by myself. Our mystery drama, The Thomas Jefferson Defense, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The year 1775. The fuse of defiance has already been lighted. It is now hissing and sputtering towards the powder keg of rebellion. Thomas Jefferson has feelings of uneasiness and guilt all around him. He hears outcries for freedom, justice, equality, and yet he knows these fervent demands are not being made for everybody. There are those human beings who have neither equality nor equity in this brave new world that is soon to be born. As a matter of fact, because of their skin color, they are not considered to be human beings at all. Good evening, Carter. Good evening, Mr. Jefferson. Oh, Mr. Jefferson, is it? Whatever became of Tom? <laughs> well, sir... Oh, is it sir now? This becomes worse. Well, sir, we're going to have us a new government, ain't we? We most likely will, if we're not all hanged first. Now, the way I hear it, we've we got to get rid of old King George, true? True. Well, then, then we've got to get us a new king. Why, Carter? Well, you're going to have a country without a king. Who are the people going to obey? We shall create an equal society. Oh, it'll never work. I think you have the wrong idea. That, that, that the king will have to be a Virginian. <laughs> Why? Why? Well, there ain't nobody even worth talking about south of here. That go north. Pennsylvania's all pig farmers. New York's all potato farmers. And I wouldn't trust nobody lives in New England. <laughs> Carter, the entire idea is to get rid of king. You know, you could be king because you're the smartest. And then we got Mr. Patrick Henry, who, who's who got a powerful mouth. And Colonel Washington looks like a king. And... Ooh. Yeah? Uh, Carter, what's wrong? What, why are you so pale? Uh, are you ill? Good evening, Mr. Jefferson. Oh, welcome, Louisa. Your mother sent word you mightn't come. Well, I was feeling poorly. But Jeremy Morgan here just happened by and cheered me up. Hasn't he got the nicest smile? I tell you, it's the finest medicine. Mr. Jefferson, may I present Mr. Jeremy Morgan? Your servant, sir. Welcome, Mr. Morgan. And old scowl face here, Carter McAllister. You said you'd come here with me tonight, Louisa. Did I? Y you promised. What's a promise? It's only something you make when you won't give your word of honor. Now, I won't have it. What won't you have, I Carter? won't have you seen around with every common Tom, Dick, and Harry. Tread lightly, sir. I caution you. Who are you to caution and me? And now, gentlemen, you are both under my roof, and I will not permit things to get out of hand. Louisa, I'm taking you home. You just let go of my arm, Carter you, McAllister. I believe you heard what the lady said. You say one more word, and I shall horsewhip you. Like you horsewhip your slaves? Yes. 
you impertinent ruffian. Gentlemen, gentlemen, stop right here, or I may have to thrash the both of you. Mr. McAllister, you will give me satisfaction. Satisfaction? Satisfaction? You overstep your bounds. Satisfaction is something that only can be exchanged among gentlemen. And do you pretend to be a gentleman, Mr. McAllister? Your father's a thief who cheats his tenants. How dare you look down on me? My father traces his lineage back to King Henry II. And your mother, no doubt, traces hers back to Pocahontas. Why, you're... Oh, that's enough. Mr. Morgan, stop that. Now, don't strike him again. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, sir. I should not have lost my temper. I'll, I'll, I'll kill you. I'll, I'll kill Shut you. Up, Carter. Now you begged for it. I'll, I'll kill you. I am going to kill you, Jeremy Morgan. Nobody's going to kill anybody. Walter Fred, help him to the sofa. Get some cloths. Get some vinegar. Jeremy Morgan, I shall shoot you down like the mongrel dog you are. Oh, do be quiet, both of you, Mr. Jefferson. May I retire to your sitting room? Mr. Jefferson, I'm sorry. I, I had no right to abuse your hospitality. Therefore, if you'll excuse me... Uh, Mr. Will... Morgan... Uh, Jeremy, wait, wait. Now, son, there's no need for you to run off. I know I'm not welcome. Oh, that's nonsense. This is my house. I should never have come. How can you say that? You're Lord Arthur Morgan's son. Your father was a dear friend of mine. Was my mother? You see, sir, I forgot my place. Jeremy, your place in this world is whatever you can win through strength and skill and courage. Every man has the opportunity to prove himself. Every man is free to strive. You really don't believe that. I do. How can you? You own slaves. Uh, I'm sorry, I... I had no right to say that. It's a difficult, complicated world. I agree, sir. Especially for me. You may be somewhat oversensitive. <laughs> After all, Louisa Henderson did seem quite taken with you. No. I saw what all that meant the moment we entered the room. I was just an instrument. An instrument? With which she could provoke Carter McAllister. <laughs> oh, you're very young. And very cynical. And very right, Mr. Jefferson. Jeremy, I would like to be your friend. There's no need to consider my feelings. I mean that, Jeremy, sincerely. Oh, look at yourself. You've barely grown out of your childhood, and already you've abandoned your hopes. It would be best if children like me would never be born. A consolation is, we die young. Oh, now, come on. Come on back in with me. We shall have some wine. Usually we die by violence. I offer you my hand in friendship. I'm grateful. But there will be violence. Come back inside. You and Carter McAllister will shake hands. No. You, Jeremy, are also to blame. You insulted him, too. Both of you must forgive each other. That cannot happen. Now, why do you say that? Aren't you willing to forgive him? Yes. I am willing to forgive him for his insult. But he will be unable to forgive me for my mother. Oh, I cannot believe that men of goodwill cannot reconcile their quarrels. Will you let me mediate between you? If it pleases you, Mr. Jefferson. However, I have decided to leave this part of the country. But why? Carter is determined to kill me. I have no wish to kill him first. Therefore, I must go. But where will you go? Back to my own people. Come in. Louisa? Now, Mr. Jefferson, I can tell from that look on your face you're about to scold me. I'm afraid I must. Well, suppose I say whatever it is I did. I'm sorry. Well, I don't think it was right of you to come here with Jeremy Morgan just so that you could make Carter angry. Oh, did you see Carter's face? Louisa, this is a serious business. One of those boys could very well kill the other. Oh, Carter talks big. He's not the killing kind. Any man can become a killer where a woman's involved. You mean somebody would kill for me? Oh, Louisa, if only you had a heart and a mind and a conscience to go with all that beauty... Do you want to know the awful truth? 
I love them both. Oh, you can't love them both. When I want to have someone to have fun with, to ride with, to dance with, I love Carter. When I need someone just to be with, to talk with, I love Jeremy. Louisa, how, how can you love Jeremy? Carter McAllister, you standing there listening at that door. You are not a man of honor. You belong to me. I belong to myself. Louisa, if I can't have you, nobody will. I'll decide who has me. Why, that, that thieving, skulking, half-breed. Carter, I cannot permit you to insult a friend of mine under my roof. I'll do more than just insult him. I'm going to kill him. Welcome, my nephew. Welcome. I have brought you a gift, Blue Cloud. Ah, a robe, a rich robe. It comes from England, across the seas. It is a robe of great value. Such color. One may not fully realize the color by firelight. When the sun rises tomorrow, one's eyes will behold a robe of brilliant scarlet. The color of blood. You wonder why I come here, Uncle? I wait for you to speak. I have come come back. Back? To my people. We are not your people, my son. You are my mother's people. Are they unkind to you? The other sons of your father? No. They treat me well. We are brothers. Then why do you wish to come here? Because there is no place, no real place for me in their world. Why do you say this? The women mock me. The men make sport of me. Only one sees me as a true friend. Tom Jefferson. Jefferson. You have called him Red Hair. Yes. Yes, I know him. So you wish to live with your mother's people? Yes. Because you are afraid. I want peace. There is no peace. There can be no peace for your mother's people. There is no peace for me in my father's village. You must go back. Why? Soon we shall be driven from here. They want to turn our woods into fields to raise their tobacco. Your mother's people shall be destroyed. No. You can lose yourself in the forest and live out your life in peace and safety. But there shall only be misery for your children and death for your children's children. What is there that I must do? Your father's voice was strong in the councils for our people. Your voice must be heard there, too. You must make them listen. Why would they listen to me? By some, I am called a half-breed. You are strong, young... Wise, you were born to make a new understanding between people. It is your destiny. If I go back, I will surely die. The day, the hour, the moment of your death has already been cast. And it shall find you wherever you are. Yes, Blue Cloud, I see now. I must go back. Hold on. Well, it's Carter. Yeah, Carter. Don't take one more step or I'll put a bullet in you. Well, you've got a weapon. I'm unarmed. No wonder I hear such courage in your voice. Don't. Provoke me, Jeremy. I came after you to kill you. Yes? It was just before sundown. I saw you going into the woods carrying that bright scarlet robe. It was a gift for my uncle, Blue Cloud. What do you want now, Carter? Good, I thought. He sees the light. He's going back to his own people. So, I let you go. Thank you. But I was wrong. You're coming back to town. No, you were right. I am going back to my own people. Your people are back there in the woods. My people are everywhere. I, I don't want to kill you. Go back to the woods. Paint your face. 
stick a feather in your hair. Stand aside. I have business in town. Go back where you belong. I warn you. I'll kill you. You're not going to kill anybody. Stop. Don't make me do it. Stop. I'll shoot. I I told you I'd shoot. I told you. Both very young, very proud, quick to anger. They were barely out of their teens, and now one of them lies dead, shot in the back by the musket of the other. And it happened on the very eve of the American Revolution, for some of the reasons the revolution came about in the first place. Reasons of pride, uncontrolled passions, and sheer blindness. But the fight that led to this midnight killing began in Thomas Jefferson's home. So you can expect to see him again in just a few moments when Mystery Theater returns with Act Two. Two is company, three is a crowd, and any time you have a crowd, look for trouble. When a beautiful girl cannot make up her mind between two handsome young men, something has to give. And in this case, what has been given is the life of Jeremy Morgan. And naturally, the prime suspect is Carter McAllister. Come in. You, you wish to see me, Father? Shut the door and sit down. Yeah, yes, sir. I understand Jeremy Morgan has been shot to death. Oh? Has I'll he... thank you not to play the innocent with me. You know he's been murdered. Well, how, how would I know? Because enough people have told me they heard you swear you would shoot him. Because at any minute, the sheriff can knock on my door with a warrant for your arrest. Well, they can't hang me. And why not? Well, because because he, he was only a half-breed. Unfortunately, his father was the late Lord Morgan... His brothers, Jeff and William, accepted him. He was well-liked. Oh, Oh, Father, you you have to save me. Fool, did you have to kill him yourself? With all the riffraff hereabouts, couldn't you have hired a man? Please, please. uh, Father, please get me out of it. I I, I don't want to hang. You should have thought of that all long before. I never wanted Louisa Henderson. The the match was your idea. You're the one who needs your father's money. Yes, I, I, I killed him. But you also had a hand oh, now in it. Oh, be quiet. Now, now, tell me everything. The truth now. Well, uh, I waited for him near the woods. Mm. He, he came along. Mm. He, he was carrying a, a red robe. Mm. Like Indians like to wear. A red robe? Yeah, yeah, brilliant scarlet. Well, uh, well I thought he, he intends to go back to his own people. Uh, therefore? Therefore? Well, I, I followed him. Mm. He headed toward Blue Cloud's village. Fool! If he had decided to return to the Indians, why did you have to kill him? But he didn't return. I I saw him go into Blue Cloud's tent. I I heard him talk. About what? I don't know. I I don't understand their stupid language. But but they were angry with each other. How do you know? Why, why, I think their voices sounded angry. Hmm. Well, then, I I watched him as he came out of the tent. He he wasn't going to stay. He was Hmm. headed back. so, So I... Yes, yes, speak up. Well, I, I moved ahead of him and stopped a few miles away. And I said to him, hmm. I said, go back to your own people. Stay with them or I'll kill you. And, 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 and he didn't believe me. And, and, and now everybody knows I killed him. I... What everybody knows is a lie. But Now you listen to me. You are innocent. You did not shoot Jeremy Morgan. But, Father... You are a fool. All you can do is get yourself into trouble and then come whimpering to me. You're my son, and I must save you. Yes, yes, Father. First off, who saw you heading for the woods? Uh, uh, I I passed by Pearson's farm. Mm. Noah Pearson owes me money. Um... 
I, I passed by Louisa Henderson and her mother. She was going out riding. Very well. You went into the woods. Uh, and then I'll hang. No, I... no, no, because you didn't shoot Jeremy Morgan. What? Now, let me tell you what happened. You wanted to shoot him. You followed him into the woods. You saw him go into Blue Cloud's tent. You heard them fight. Yeah, but but I'm not sure this is what they were actually doing. Oh, yes, doing. you are. Your anger had meanwhile cooled, and you knew deep in your heart that you could never kill another human being. You do know that, don't you? Yes. And so you headed back for home. Suddenly you heard a shot. You turned around. The angry blue cloud had followed Jeremy Morgan and put a bullet into his back. When he saw you, he fled. Do you understand me? Yes. Yes. Now, how do you know it was Blue Cloud? How do... It had to be Blue Cloud. He was wearing that robe, that brilliant scarlet robe. Yeah, yeah. Father, will they believe me? (laughs) It's your word against that of an Indian. But it's not... Tell the story calmly and look every man in the eye as you say it. And of course, they'll believe you. And that's what happened. It it's the cloud. Indian Blue Cloud. Now, just a minute, Edmund McAllister. Now, Tom, everybody knows how you feel about Indians. And everybody knows how you feel about him, too, Edmund. This is surely a crime. That Jeremy Morgan was a fine, upstanding young man. And that skulking savage shot him in the back. Why? Why? (laughs) Who can figure what goes on in the mind of a redskin? It isn't as if they were fully human. Blue Cloud loved his nephew. He had no reason to shoot him. My son, Carter, heard the whole thing and saw the whole thing. Your son, Carter, stated clearly in front of witnesses that he had every intention of shooting Jeremy Morgan. Sir... Are you calling my boy a liar? I'm saying it's a matter of his word against Blue Clouds. I warn you, Tom Jefferson. You're getting mighty big around here as a politician. But you can't go around insulting people. You are a bigoted, ignorant man, and that's the truth. You're too old for me to whip. And that son of yours is a product of your upbringing. And you accuse Blue Cloud of murder? He was seen to do it. By whom? By my son. That's by whom. Why don't you let him speak for himself? Carter, did you see, did you actually see Blue Cloud shoot Jeremy Morgan? Well, did you? Would you be willing to place your hand on the Bible and swear in the name of God that you saw Blue Cloud murder Jeremy, would you? Of course he would. I'm asking him. Would you swear, Carter? Uh, Yes. Yes, yes, I would. All right. Then come with me to the sheriff. And swear out a warrant for his arrest. What arrest? You don't arrest an Indian. He commits a crime. You go out and shoot him. Hold on, Edmund McAllister. Oh, you can surely talk, Tom Jefferson. But we have had enough talk. Any of you folk who agree with me, let's go home and get our rifles. Mr. Jefferson, sir, it's an honor. Some men are intent on murdering Chief Blue Cloud. Well, sir, he did kill Jeremy Morgan. He has been accused of killing Jeremy Morgan. Well, ain't that the same thing? Oh, no, Sheriff, you cannot permit murder to take place in this country. Well, Mr. Jefferson, uh, it ain't murder exactly. After all, Blue Cloud's only an Indian. Any man has a right to be protected by the law. That's true. That's, that's absolutely true. Now, now, the... Uh, the McAllisters and all of them, uh, they ain't going to go out there to kill Blue Cloud. Well, that's not the way I heard it. Well, you see, as uh, concerned citizens, uh, we're just going to bring him back here for, for trial. Uh-huh, I see. And then he'll be shot while resisting arrest. Now, now, or Mr. perhaps Jefferson, while but... trying to escape. Sheriff, you just can't walk into Blue Cloud's village and murder him. I ain't saying I agree with it, Mr. Sheriff... Jefferson. Why not? Why not? Do you think his young men will stand idly by... The answer to that question is yes. Now, you see, Mr. Jefferson, he ain't liked. Blue Cloud, that is. I don't understand. Well, the young men, they want a fighting chief. Uh, 
Which you got to admit, now, Blue Cloud ain't. Still, they <clears throat> can't just sit by and watch? The thing is being arranged. And nobody's going to be in the village. I refuse to believe it. No, everybody gets what they want. The tribe gets a new chief, uh, one who would want to go to war. War? What war? They know what happens when they raid our frontier settlements. They know the retribution. They'll go to war on our side against the British. So that's what they get. The white folks avenge a murder. Which hasn't been proved. Proof, Mr. Jefferson, is usually a matter of satisfaction. And all for just the life of one Indian. All in all, it ain't a bad situation. I've admired you. I've respected you for many years. But I see now you're unfit to be a sheriff. I'm doing what everybody else is doing. I'm thinking of me first. You took an oath to uphold the law. I won't see murder committed. Well, now, what do y'all suggest? What I've been suggesting, I suggest that I you I have ride a better out. suggestion. Why don't you ride out because there? Because I'm not the sheriff. Yes, you are. Yeah. I hereby swear you in as deputy sheriff. What? What are you doing? Well, you now have the authority to uphold the law. If you think a crime is about to be committed, it's your duty to prevent it. I, I have no experience. <laughs> you got plenty of experience, Mr. Jefferson. I watched you grow up. Everybody knows you was meant for high things. You're going to be an important man in this country. <laughs> I don't throw everything away for... For what? For an Indian. <sighs> Sheriff... All right, write down on a piece of paper the fact that I am your duly authorized deputy. We think in terms of intellect and action. We rarely see both qualities combined in one man. How few are the philosopher warriors in history? And yet, for the most part, the great men of 1776 could think and fight. Well, Thomas Jefferson has thought it over and decided it's worth the battle. Therefore, you should stay exactly where you are until Mystery Theater returns in just a few moments. The beginning of the year 1775 sees Thomas Jefferson deeply involved in the pursuit of justice in two separate areas. First, you know all about the struggle for independence from Britain. This is the big picture, the historical picture. But second, there is a small picture, indeed a tiny, almost invisible picture. This is the pursuit of justice, not as an ideal, but as a practical matter for a single human being. Those are always the toughest. Welcome to my lodge, Red Hair. Chief Blue Cloud, there is no time for ceremonies. You must leave here at once. For what reason? Men are coming to kill you. Why? For the murder of your sister's son. It is well known that he was murdered in a cowardly manner by a young man who insulted yes. him. Well, that is not the way many people will have it. They accuse you. He was as a son to me. Blue, th there is no time for the right and wrong of it. Men are coming here to do murder. Run from them. Am I a coward? I run from no one. One of our greatest poets has said discretion is the better part of valor. Where may I run? Deeper into the forest. Mm. They will pursue... No one knows this wilderness the way you do. I will not be a hunted animal for the rest of my days. Besides, it is late. They come. There he is! Now hold up there. Uh, now, now you stand clear of him, Mr. Jefferson. All of you. Now turn around and go back to your home. Now see here. Who are you to order I us? I have here a piece of paper. I am acting in the capacity of the sheriff. Ah, now, Mr. Jefferson, the Indian's guilty of a murder. Who says so? We have got a witness. Who is your witness? My son here, Carter. You saw Chief Blue Cloud murder Jeremy Morgan. 
Well, Carter? Speak the truth, son. Speak the truth. Yes. Is he being charged with murder? Well, do you charge him, Carter? Say yes. I'm asking Carter. Yes. So that settles that. Now, why don't we just shoot him? He'll have to shoot me first. Now, Tom Jefferson... That's how it is, gentlemen. We will have the law here. You will also have to shoot me. So, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Hayden, Mr. Wolverton, the rest of you, is that what you're willing to do? Shoot me? Tom. Tom! We're entitled to justice. Justice can only be dispensed in a court of law. You mean have a trial for, for an Indian? You know they're only a waste of time. I intend to enforce the law. Now, how will you gentlemen have it? <laughs> well, there's, uh, there's no real difference. Instead of shooting him now, we can hang him later. And so, you say, uh, you followed Mr. Morgan all the way to the Shawnee village? Ye yes, sir. And you saw him enter Blue Cloud's lodge? Yes, sir. And you heard them quarrel? Ye yes, sir. And then you saw Mr. Morgan leave the tent, move into the forest, and then you heard a shot? I did. Now, describe what you saw. Well, uh, I, I turned around and, and there was, uh... Jeremy Morgan falling down dead, and Chief Blue Cloud was uh, uh, was standing over him with, with a smoking musket. Are you sure it was Blue Cloud? Yeah, I, I'm positive. How? Why? What makes you so sure? Because I... Uh, I could see his splendid scarlet robe. The robe that we found in his lodge? Yes, sir, the very same. Eh. Your witness, Mr. Jefferson... Well, not every witness is fortunate to have his own father appointed public prosecutor. I must, however, ask some questions that may not have occurred to him. Why did you follow Mr. Morgan into the woods? Uh, well... Isn't it true that you intended to kill him? Well... Uh... You must answer. Isn't it true that he escorted Miss Louisa Henderson to a party at my house? There, you two got into a fight, didn't you? Threatened to shoot him? Yes, sir. Good. And when you followed him into the woods, isn't it true that you were carrying a musket? Uh, yes, sir. Why? Well, well I... Uh... Did you intend to kill him? You armed yourself for that purpose, and now, when the deed is done, isn't it true that you are trying to place the blame on Chief Blue Cloud's shoulder? I object. Your Honor, let him answer the question. Go ahead, son. Answer him. Tell him it isn't so. Without prompting... Is it true you want Blue Cloud to hang for your crime? I... I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him! Blue Cloud, you are accused of murder. Tell us, are you or are you not guilty? I am innocent. Gentlemen, I believe him. lose courage, Blue Cloud. The gods will not permit justice to be mocked. Red hair. The gods do not permit justice to be mocked. But they allow it to be tested. I... I shall see you in the morning. Yes. The morning. It shall be my last morning. You must never give up hope. I cannot give up what I have never had. We can do more. Oh. Huh. Come come in, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, my, my father isn't home. Uh, has he left for the courthouse? Y yes, sir. He likes to go early. I, I thought perhaps you might like to walk down there with me. Well, uh, sir, sh should we be seen together? <laughs> Why not? Oh, well, uh, we're, <laughs> we're on opposite sides. I'm uh, still your friend, Carter. Well, shall we, uh, shall we have our stroll? Yes, sir. I, I was just leaving. 
So, you insist you didn't kill Jeremy? Please, sir, we, we, we've already been through all that. I, I know. I also know it's a lie. Mr. Jefferson, I must ask you to let me alone. Oh, I'll let you alone. And I'm even sure your conscience will let you alone. I am not listening to any more you're saying. Yes, your conscience died a long time ago. And do you know who killed it? You did. You, Carter. Well, what are you talking about? A man's conscience is what makes him live a man's life. But you're not a man. You're a creature. You're a pathetic, crawling creature of your father. Sir, you have no right to insult my father. No one may be insulted by the truth. You're his creature. You don't think for yourself. Act for yourself. Live for yourself. Why? Why do you tolerate it? Because I'm nobody. I'm nothing. I, I, don't, I, I don't know anything. I can't do anything. I'm stupid. Who says so? Oh, my father. And all I, all I have is the prospect of inheriting his estate when he dies. You'll have worked for it. Everybody knows I'm a fool. That's not yeah, and true. Louisa, why do you think she even looked at me? She knows I'll be rich one day. It's not true. There's nothing wrong with you. Oh. Please, Mr. Jefferson. Now, look, you have to stand up to your father. You have to let him know you're a man. I will, I will. From now on, no, I will. No, no, no. You have to stand up to him now. Tell the truth. But, but I'll die. Possibly, but if you don't tell the truth, you'll surely die. What life can be left to you, huh? You'll spend the rest of your days even deeper within your father's shadow? Mr. Jefferson... What do you want me to do? Take the stand. Tell the truth. No. I can't do it. I just can't do it. Well, Mr. Jefferson, you may as well go home and get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Tomorrow, for sure, the trial has to end. Tomorrow, for sure. People will keep wondering how you managed to keep it going even this long. The jury was ready with its verdict at the end of the first day. <laughs> the jury was ready before the trial even started. Well, it's open and shut. I mean, I wish it wasn't, but it's open and shut. Yes, yes. Carter follows Jeremy into the woods, sees him enter Blue Cloud's teepee, hears sounds of a quarrel. Sees Jeremy leave the teepee, re-enter the woods, and then sees and hears Blue Cloud shoot him. Now, wait, 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 just... He says he heard them quarrel. You hmm. have something, Mr. Jefferson? You say they quarreled. Yes, sir. In which language? Well, uh... Must have been Shawnee. Do you speak Shawnee? No, sir. Do you understand it? No, sir. Well, then how do you know they quarrel? I... I... Well, please answer the question. I... Um... One need not know the language to know there is a quarrel. Your Honor, I must insist that the witness answer. Well, I... I, I could tell. You, you could actually hear the anger in the, in the voices. Your Honor, Mr. Jefferson clearly has exhausted his resources. He has no more evidence... He keeps going over the same ground. Mr. Jefferson, have you any more evidence? Uh, well, Your Honor... I must ask you then to bring your case to a conclusion. Uh, Your Honor, I... I do have further evidence. Then you may bring it here. Uh, Your Honor, I... I'm sorry, but I cannot bring it here. Then how may we evaluate it? We must go to where it exists. If it exists? It does exist, but... Only at night. I'm afraid I cannot follow, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, Your Honor, the evidence exists at the scene of the crime, and since it cannot be moved from its place, we must attend it there. Your Honor, this is just another scheme on the part of... A man's Mr. life is at stake. What do you propose, Mr. Jefferson? Well, the murder was committed at ten in the evening. At uh, 10 this evening, I suggest we all assemble at the place where it occurred. Where 
were you standing, Carter? Uh, behind this tree. Uh-huh. Well, would you place yourself there, if you please? This is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Carter, how far down the path was Jeremy? Oh, uh, about 25 yards. Uh-huh. Sheriff, uh, would you pace off 25 yards? Take the prisoner with you. All right, Mr. Jefferson. Very well. Uh, Your Honor, gentlemen, here is the scene as it existed on the night of the murder. We are all standing in a line with Carter. We all hear a shot. A fire in the air, Sheriff. Yes, sir. We all turn to look. We see Jeremy fall to the ground. Uh, Sheriff, uh, fall to the ground, please. Now, we all see a figure standing there in the darkness. It is not easy to make out the face. He didn't have to see the face. He recognized the red cloak. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, which one of you has supernatural eyesight? Which one of you would swear on the Holy Bible that the cloak is brilliant scarlet, as Carter testified? Which one of you is possessed of the ability to distinguish color in the dark? It's a trick, Your Honor. Carter McAllister lied about the cloak. Therefore, he did not identify Blue Cloud. Therefore, we must now consider his motive. Don't you ever say a word, boy. No, I will. I'm tired of lying. Be quiet. I, I killed him. I killed Jeremy Morgan. But God have mercy on my soul. Your Honor, the defense rests. <laughs> I'll be back with a final thought in just a moment. Well, they didn't hang him. It was a crime of passion, and our forefathers were men who understood passion. He was sentenced to hard labor and later paroled to join a regiment of Virginia cavalry. And the people never forgot him, or Blue Cloud, or the Thomas Jefferson defense. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Leon Janney, Russell Horton, Jada Rowland, and Bob Caliban. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. again to elect a president of the United States. Soon they will take the 36th ballot and hope this time to break the six-day deadlock between Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Jefferson is still one state short of the required nine-state majority, and unless he's elected on this 36th ballot, the events of the past few days indicate that violence and bloodshed will descend on this infant's capital. The 16 tellers appointed by the Speaker of the House will poll their states, then they will drop the votes in the two ballot boxes provided by the sergeant at arms. The votes Washington, reported to February 17, the 181, the, the House Congress. of Representatives. You are there. CBS takes you back 147 years. It is less than a generation since the end of the revolution which established the United States of America. Now the young republic faces the threat of another revolution arising out of a deadlocked presidential election. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there... You are there. You Are There is produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. And Walter Hamden plays Thomas Jefferson in today's broadcast. You Are There is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. 
And now? 1801, the gallery of the House of Representatives and John Daly. This dramatic deadlock has come about in spite of the fact that Jefferson received the majority of the popular vote. A group of willful men in the Federalist Party, losers in the popular vote, are still trying desperately to block the people's choice. A tie in the Electoral College through this election into the House of Representatives, and here the Federalists are still hoping to elect Aaron Burr when he was meant to be Jefferson's running mate on the successful Democratic-Republican ticket. They think of Aaron Burr a lesser evil than Thomas Jefferson. And now, on the 36th ballot, they're still pushing Burr against Jefferson for president. This confused situation. Your attention, please. The Speaker of the House, Mr. Theodore Sedgwick, is pounding the gavel, and it looks as if the 36th ballot is about to be taken, so over to the rostrum. The gentleman from Delaware, the Honorable James A. Beard, has requested that we postpone the balloting for 30 minutes. Are there any objections? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. We have been confined to this hall for six days. We're like prisoners, eating here, sleeping here, going about in our nightcaps, never permitted to go to our hearts and homes. Why must we have further delay? Yes. Yes. May I remind the gentleman that his colleague from Maryland is also dying here? If he can risk his life, we can risk another half hour. Are there any objections? I hear none. The request is granted. The 36th ballot will begin in 30 minutes. And as you heard, a delay in the voting. Mr. Bayard, who asked for the postponement, is the only congressman from Delaware. And it has been rumored in this rumor-ridden capital that Alexander Hamilton, leader of the Federalists and a bitter foe of Thomas Jefferson, is nevertheless urging Bayard to switch the single vote of Delaware to Mr. Jefferson. This request from Bayard now for a postponement suggests that these rumors may be true. We shall see. Anyway, the supporters of Mr. Jefferson everywhere are grimly determined to elect the man of their choice. Around the nation, there are demonstrations and threats by armed men, Jefferson supporters, who are preparing to march on Washington. Virginia, Jefferson's home state, is probably the strongest center of pro-Jefferson feeling, so we take you now to Richmond, Virginia, Jack Walters reporting. I'm in the executive office of Governor James Monroe. The roll of drums and the bugle you can hear are coming from the great courtyard below. The Virginia militia has been assembling down there since early this morning. I'd guess that there are about a thousand men here, fully outfitted for a long march. Governor Monroe is here at our microphone. Governor, when will the Virginia militia march on Washington? Upon my orders, Mr. Walter. And can you tell me, Governor, when you will give your marching orders? If the Federalist Party continues to plot treason, we are ready to put it down. If the political knaves of the Federalist Party succeed in their nefarious plot to elect Aaron Burr over Jefferson, we shall avenge this violation of the people's will. I've been in touch with Governor McKean of Pennsylvania. His militia, too, is fully armed and ready. We are prepared to march troops instantly upon the capital for the purpose not of promoting, but of preventing revolution and the shedding of a single drop of blood. But, Governor, there are rumors that some 1,500 Democrats from Virginia and Maryland threaten to assassinate anyone who takes the presidency other than Thomas Jefferson. This is a wild story, Mr. Walters, published, no doubt, by the same inflammatory Federalist paper that accused Mr. Jefferson of the Sabbath massacre of two million people, among them women, children, and 24,000 priests. <laughs> a slight exaggeration. The Federalist big wigs must learn that they cannot frighten the American citizens. They should have learned it when the people abolished the Federalist-inspired alien and sedition law. Their plots against the people did not work then, and they will not work now. Well, thank you, Governor Monroe. New York City is another stronghold of Jeffersonian supporters. We take you there now. Arthur Hannes reporting. Go ahead, Hannes. I'm in the headquarters of the Sons of Tammany. The members of this so-called ancient order here in Manhattan are gathering in this somewhat ancient building to march on Washington. The men crowding this building, which they call the Wigwam, wear Indian costumes and long, colorful feathers. They are men from the ordinary walks of life, the tradesmen, mechanics, and carpenters, the builders of this growing city. 
Here beside me is a man who calls himself an independent carpenter, uh, yes, and he's a fiery I speaker who just a few moments ago made a speech calling for a march on Washington. Uh, His name is Timothy Ryan. Mr. Ryan, will you tell us, does Mr. Burr know that you make speeches against him? I care not a tinker's dam for the opinion of Aaron Burr. He, he's, he's deceived us like a jurist. Well, Mr. Ryan, can you tell us where Mr. Burr is now? As, as long as I have been a member of the Sons of Tammany, I have never seen Aaron Burr step foot in the wigwam. He works through, through his leaders. We will not sully himself to congregate in our midst. Right now, I, I hear tell that he's, he's hiding in Albany, a hundred miles away. And well, he might be to, to escape our wrath. We should not only march on Washington to put down the traitors, but we should also march on Albany and put away Aaron Burr. Mr. Ryan, our reports tell us that Mr. Burr is in Albany because his daughter is being married there. Uh, but well, you tell me, as a loyal son of Tammany, Mr. Ryan, did you not yourself vote for Aaron Burr? Yeah, I... That I did. God help me. But I meant him for vice president, as all the voters did. It, it is Jefferson that we elected for president, and well does Burr know it. We were told to write two names on our ballot, and we wrote Jefferson and Burr. And we were not told to designate who for president, who for vice president. Any fool knew if he was on it. But Burr has also done nothing to take the first place away from Mr. Jefferson. Yeah, but he's done nothing to give it to him either. No, Mr. Ryan. In any case, according to the Constitution, the House must now make the final choice. Yeah, well, it's up that's to the law. Yeah. And you men, aren't you defying the law by your march on Washington? Oh, defying the law, are we? Well, then I say we shall change the law. Change the Constitution. But let not the people be deprived of justice and cheated out of the man they voted for. Thanks be to the Lord that we defeated the Federalist Tories by a great majority. But if Burr is elect by the insidious plot of a band of apostates, I say, in vain have we fought for liberty, in vain have we fought the British misrule. I say, you fall to pressers, on to Washington. We have declared we'll be free. And neither bully or coach will deprive us of our natural rights. Thank you. On to Washington. Thank you very on much, to... Mr. Ryan. Right. While we've been reporting from here in New York, we've had word that Ken Roberts in the Capitol has succeeded in arranging an interview with Alexander Hamilton. So back to Washington and Ken Roberts. I'm in the library of the home of Mr. Josiah Quincy, Federalist Whip. Alexander Hamilton is waiting to meet Congressman James Bayard here. And while waiting, he consented to an interview. He has, however, stepped into the drawing room at the moment. In spite of the tensions and threats of violence that are shaking the few buildings in this capital, Washington society has not abandoned its social life. Right now, there's a party going on in this splendid mansion in the wilderness. The music is coming from the drawing room. Mrs. Josiah Quincy, our hostess, is here beside me, and she has offered to tell us a little about her prominent guests. Are they all Federalists, Mrs. Quincy? Oh, no, indeed, Mr. Roberts. Even a member of Mr. Jefferson's party can find a haven of refuge here from the torture of the miserable boarding houses in Washington. Even Mr. Jefferson himself? Oh, good grief, no. Perhaps he would enjoy the excellent company here and your wonderful canvas back duck. Indeed, he'd be welcome. But I suspect that Mr. Jefferson would prefer to be surrounded by, oh, shall we say, more loyal admirers at Conrad's boarding house where he resides. Moreover, I doubt that he's given to the singing of psalms. To be sure, even an atheist may love to sing psalms, but certainly not in close harmony with Federalists. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson and his minister would deny he is an atheist. Oh, if you'll forgive me a moment, I'll close the door. Certainly. There are many notables gracing this home today. Mr. Robert Fulton, the inventor, is in the far corner of this library. Mr. Fulton is trying to raise capital for a new invention of his, a missile that can be fired underwater from a submarine vessel. Well, Mrs. Quincy has shut the library door, and Gouverneur Morris, the senator from New York, has come into the library with her. They're chatting now, and in a moment, Mrs. Quincy should be with us again. Right now, I can see Robert Fulton thumbing through a volume of Shakespeare. The English playwright is quite a favorite in this library. As a matter of fact, anything English is preferred in the home of a Federalist. Mrs. Quincy told me a blue ribbon evening was passed here last night when the senator from Kentucky read The Merry Wives of Windsor yeah, and the first act of Hamlet Robert. to the ladies. Oh, thank Meanwhile, you. Meanwhile, I brought you Governor Morris, but you mustn't ask him any questions about politics. Thank you, Mrs. Quincy. 
And uh, thank you, Senator Morris. Do you oh. think, Senator, that Mr. Hamilton will persuade Bayard of Delaware to break the deadlock today by voting for Jefferson? Oh, now, please, no embarrassing question. Senator Morris has just ended a very weary and dangerous trip from New York. Ask the Senator how he liked Washington. Senator, how do you like Washington? <laughs> Washington's fine. I almost got lost in the woods through Maryland, but Washington's fine. We only need here houses, cellars, kitchens, scholarly men, amiable women. Uh, you, of course, my dear Mrs. Quincy, are the exquisite exception. Thank you, Senator Morris. And a few more trifles are needed here to possess a perfect city. In a word, this is the best city in the world to live in in the future. We hope so, Senator. But as you know, there are threats of destruction of this capital by armed militia from Virginia and Pennsylvania if Jefferson is not chosen today. Do you think Hamilton will save the capital today by uh, saying... Ah, uh, uh, you promised no questions on politics, Mr. Roberts. And I see that you're leading to a question on Hamilton again. My dear, Washington is drunk with politics. The Federalists are like drunken men in their hatred for Jefferson. They believe that Jefferson's ideas on government are ideas of the rabble of revolutionary France. But Mr. Hamilton, alone among the Federalists, has remained sober. He believes, and I agree with him, that if the people want Jefferson, they must have him. A government must be fitted to a nation as a coat to an individual. Thank you, Senator Gouverneur Morris. Uh, now, the door of the library has just been opened and Mr. Hamilton has come in. He's coming toward our microphone. Mr. Hamilton, is it true that you are trying to persuade Mr. Bayard to cast his vote against Aaron Burr on the 36th ballot? It is true that I am against the Catiline of America becoming, in fact, the man of our party. Mr. Burr is far more cunning than wise, far more dexterous than able. If Mr. Burr acts ill, we must share in the blame and disgrace. But, Mr. Hamilton, if your pressure to defeat Burr is effective, won't you then, in fact, be electing your greatest enemy, Thomas Jefferson? Mr. Jefferson's ideas of democracy are a danger to our country and the prospects of our country under the evil of foreign democratic doctrines and French Jacobism are far from brilliant. The mass of the people are far from sound. Democracy is the most visionary theory. Democracy is a disease, the poison of which is most virulent. Mr. Hamilton, to what specific ideas on the platform of Jefferson are you opposed? Mr. Jefferson would have a government with no army, no navy. A national defense not by arms, but by embargoes, and as little government as possible from within. These are the pernicious dreams which put our country on the steep descent to ruin. But if you are opposed to the democracy of Mr. Jefferson and opposed to the politics of Mr. Burr, how are you urging Mr. Baird to vote? That will be for Mr. Baird to decide. But for heaven's sake, let not the Federalist Party be responsible for the elevation of Burr. There is a man in the world I ought to despise. It is Jefferson. But the public good must be paramount to every private consideration. I'm afraid I'll have to take Mr. Hamilton away now, Mr. Roberts. Congressman Baird has arrived. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Not at all. This is Ken Roberts. I return you now to John Daly in the House of Representatives. In this committee room of the House of Representatives lies Congressman Joseph H. Nicholson of Maryland. He is the representative referred to earlier by the Speaker of the House as the man who is risking his life here. Congressman Nicholson has just come out of a coma, the result of a raging fever which has not abated for six days ever since he was carried through the blinding snowstorm of last Wednesday. Somehow, as if by a miracle, this dying man gathers his strength to inscribe the name Thomas Jefferson on a slip of paper placed in his hands by his wife. Mrs. Nicholson has just guided his feeble hand as he wrote the name for the 36th time on the forthcoming 36th ballot. Mrs. Nicholson is kneeling beside her husband's bed, supporting his head on her arms. Gently, she lays his head back on the pillow and turns now to our microphone. Mrs. Nicholson, there are some who say that by awakening your husband in his condition to vote, you take upon yourself a dread responsibility. It is my husband's fervent plea. My wish, too. For we are both faced with a more dreadful responsibility than the life of a single patriot. We're faced with the lives, the fortunes, and the sacred honor of a whole people. Of some, I know I must ask pardon for quoting the Declaration of Independence. For there are men among us who seek to bury alive this child of freedom, though it is but a score and five years old. But in this room, ma'am, there are many Federalists who have come out of respect and admiration for the patriotism and the courage of you and your husband. Oh, yes. 
It is the custom of conspirators to pay homage in the manner that the senators of Rome paid homage to Caesar. I have heard that a certain Federalist fears that my husband takes his life in his hands by his determination to remain here for the final vote, and that this Federalist would not thus expose himself for any president on earth. To this summer soldier, I say, do not fear for your life, for you are already dead. The Federalist Party has been pronounced dead by the popular vote of the people. Mrs. Nicholson, I hope that your husband need risk his life no longer and that the Congress elects a president on this 36th ballot. And now, if you'll excuse me, Ned Kalmer reports a heated quarrel in the corridor downstairs. Go ahead, Ned Kalmer. <laughs> Matthew Lyons, Democratic congressman from Vermont, one of the two states whose vote is divided, has just accused John Brown, the Federalist congressman from Rhode Island, of attempting to bribe him into voting for Burr. Only the intervention of cooler heads kept them from coming to blows. They've calmed down a little now, but Congressman Lyons says he's willing to repeat for us his denunciation of the Federalist representative. Mr. Lyons, as you know, spent four months in prison last year for opposing the alien and sedition laws. Congressman Lyons, sir, what did Mr. Brown say that made you attack him? I have been warning him, but the man is ignorant of my principles. He's an agent of the Federalist traitors. But what did he say to you, sir? He urged me to vote for Burr just now, for Burr, and of course I refused. And then he said to me, the scoundrel... What did you say, sir? Yes, sir, that's exactly what you are, sir, a scoundrel. What is it you want, Congressman Lyons, he said. Is it office? Is it money? Only say what you want, and you shall have it. Now, Mr. Brown, sir, have you any comment to make? Yes, the gentleman from Vermont is a liar. Like all atheists are liars, and all the followers of Jefferson are atheists. Now, just a moment. They just despise moment. the truth as they despise God. And their hatred for God is equal to their hatred for those who own property. Oh, what? No. Why, these, these Democrats, these, these paupers, these vagabonds and outlaws, I say take away their vote. Or they will pillage our towns and stain our soil with blood. Ridiculous. Perfect. Sir, I merely want to avoid bloodshed. For if Jefferson is elected, there is scarcely a possibility that we shall escape civil war. But, Congressman, there are some who say that if Jefferson is not elected, there will be civil war. Well, then let it come. It is bad, but less, far less than anarchy or slavery. And I say that it is the Federalist Party that means to have a monarchy rather than a republic. Oh, better than rabble rule. But the people will rise up, my dear sir. They will rise up and abolish the indignities of the Federalist Party. By rise up, sir, do you mean revolution by force? No, sir, I do not. That's exactly what he means, no, sir. No, I most certainly do not. My father-in-law was Ethan Allen. And when his Green Mountain boys wanted to storm the jail in which I was imprisoned in order to free me, I urged them to desist and go to the polls to vote for their freedom and mine. And as you see, they voted me out of jail and into Congress. And I shall vote, express the will of my fellow citizens, and continue to cast my ballot for Thomas Jefferson. Well, that is your privilege, sir, but it is also mine. Thank you, you Congressman Lyons and Congressman Brown. I have just been informed that Thomas Jefferson is expected at the home of Mr. James Madison. Douglas Edwards is there, so we take you to him now. Come in, Douglas Edwards. Our hostess, Mrs. James Madison, Dolly Madison, as she's known by all, has informed us that Thomas Jefferson is on his way from his boarding house to dine here. We hope to persuade him to make a statement. To all of official Washington, this new house on F Street is more than the home of the liberal Virginian Democrat. It's a haven for tired statesmen. Most any afternoon at four, you'll find the distinguished and talented of Washington and Europe enjoying the sumptuous dinners prepared by Dolly Madison, dinners lasting far into the night. This cordial Quakeress brings a touch of warm Virginia hospitality to Washington to thaw the February cold in the frozen mud of the Capitol. Her parties and dances and card games have won over the bitterest political foes of Jefferson. Dolly Madison is here with me now. She's wearing her famed white silk turban draped with the large ostrich feathers. Margaret Baird Smith, who writes about Washington society, has said of Dolly Madison that she moves like a goddess and looks like a queen. Yes, yes. That kind of flattery is reminiscent of my old friend Aaron Burr. Before Mr. Madison and I were married, Mr. Burr's extravagant flatteries and promises were meant to blind me to his true nature. And what is your opinion of Mr. Burr now, Mrs. Madison? His methods are the same in politics as they are in love, both deceiving. But let me tell you of some of our guests. They're all waiting for the outcome of the election. We have Joel Barlow, the poet of democracy. And there's a Bonaparte. And here is Mr. Merry, minister from Great Britain. Your Excellency, uh, are your hopes on Mr. Jefferson or Mr. Burr? Well, His Majesty's government does not approve Mr. Jefferson's friendly views toward the Jacobins of France. 
Uh, my own opinion is that Mr. Jefferson has received the votes of a minority of free men and a majority of slaves. And uh, Mr. Burr, do you approve of him? Mr. Burr, uh, <clears throat> I do not want to seem too critical, but uh, Mrs. Madison's food here is more like a harvest home supper than the entertainment of a statesman. <laughs> and I thought you were enjoying our hams, Ambassador. Oh, but I... Forgive us I, I, if uh, our food is too democratic for you, but we have to sacrifice the delicacy of European taste for the less elegant but more liberal fashion of Virginia. Oh, this is Noah Wesley, Mr. Edwards. He's a Federalist, but he enjoys the company of writers here. He's a writer himself, you know. What are you writing now, Noah? I'm working on a compendious a dictionary, my dear. Good heavens, what sort of a dictionary is that? A compendious, an adjective meaning briefly stated, succinct, concise, containing the substance in narrow compass, condensed, abridged, synonym, see terse. <laughs> I see. Well, uh, as a Federalist, Mr. Webster, will you give us your compendious opinion on Mr. Jefferson and his supporters? Truth. They are rabble, threatening the safety of the state. From my observations, republicanism is impossible unless the poorer classes are excluded from the vote. Witness how the mass voted for Jefferson. Witness how they are now corrupting law and order, descending upon the capital with pikes and muskets in their hands. Savages. The primitives. Too stupid, too abject in ignorance to think rightly, and too depraved to draw honest deductions. You might do your dictionary a service, Noah, by consulting our vice president, Mr. Jefferson, for a more compendious definition of the people. For here he is now. Mr. Jefferson, this young man has asked if you'll make a statement to him on the election. Well, now, uh, I believed it my duty to be passive and silent during the present contest lest some Federalist senators accuse me of being partial whilst I yet preside over the Senate. But uh, what is it, sir, that you would like to ask me? Uh, Mr. Jefferson, do you favor or oppose the threats of imminent violence raging about this election? Whose violence? The violence of the Federalist Party to use up the people's will? Or the violence of revolution that keeps governments in order to remind them of the rights of the governed? I refer, Mr. Jefferson, to the actions of the militias of Virginia and Pennsylvania. Should that violence cause civil war or revolution, would you still hold favor with it? Yes, if the will of the majority of the voters is denied by a cabal of selfish interests bent on the destruction of democracy. But some argue, Mr. Jefferson, that the public good will be best served by keeping the peace and avoiding violence at all costs. I know there are men who would prefer that I sacrifice my principles for the guarantee of safety. But I say this is a threat and is itself pregnant with violence. I believe in a jealous care of the right of election by the people. I believe in a mild and safe corrective of abuses which are lopped by the sword of revolution where peaceable remedies are unprovided. Even if force must be invoked, the vital principle of republics is the absolute acquiescence in the decisions of the majority. Mr. Jefferson, earlier in this broadcast, Alexander Hamilton derided certain aspects of your platform, particularly your belief in democracy. Would you care to comment on that? Mr. Hamilton has a perfect right to his opinions. He has no faith in democracy. I have. I believe in and I was elected on these principles. Equal and exact justice to all men, of whatever state or persuasion, religious or political. Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. The supremacy of the civil over the military authority, the diffusion of information, and the arraignment of all abuses at the bar of public reason. These principles form the bright constellation which has gone before us and guided our steps through an age of revolution and reformation. The wisdom of our sages and the blood of our heroes have been devoted to their attainment. They should be the creed of our political faith, the text of our civic instruction, the touchstone by which to try the services of those we trust. And should we wander from them in moments of error or alarm, let us hasten to retrace our steps and to regain the road which alone leads to peace, liberty, and safety. Mr. Jefferson, those are things that can't be said too often, I think. Well, that's very nice. Of you. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. We've had word that the 36th ballot has been taken in the House of Representatives, and the results are about to be announced, so back to the House and John Daly. 
the 16 tellers are down there on the floor of the house checking the results of the 36th ballot now. And by the way, we tried to get Congressman Bayard of Delaware to tell us whether he would swing the single vote of his state from Mr. Burr to Mr. Jefferson, but he refuses to make any comment. Sitting up here in the gallery is Alexander Hamilton, uh, watching the proceedings down on the floor, and the Federalist Party leader seems a weary and disillusioned man. Whether uh, Mr. Jefferson or Mr. Burr should win this election down there on the floor, it is going to be Alexander Hamilton who is finally the loser. The congressmen in the House are silent. There's a sense of high expectancy. All eyes are on the tellers. They're comparing totals. Seem to be in agreement now as one of the tellers is writing the results on a piece of paper. But there is no indication, no sign on the face of the tellers as to whether or not the deadlock has been broken. A while ago, there were rumors that the Federalists... Uh, a teller has handed the paper now to Speaker Thomas Sedgwick. He glances at it. His face is impassive. There goes the gavel now down to the rostrum. The results of the 36th ballot. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, 10. Yeah. It's Jefferson by 10 states. One more than is necessary. Jefferson has been elected. The members of the House of Representatives and the spectators in the galleries have broken into wild, jubilant cheering and applause. Jefferson picked up two votes on that last ballot, one more than was required, and Mr. Burr lost two. I'm going to try to find out which state broke the tie and which cast the blank vote. Perhaps it was Delaware, maybe Maryland and Vermont, but we'll soon know. We'll know in a moment as soon as we... Washington, get to the February 17, 18-1. The, the House of Representatives elects Thomas Jefferson, third You have been listening to The Election of Thomas Jefferson, another broadcast in the series, You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. The Election of Thomas Jefferson was written by Joseph Liss. Walter Hamden was Thomas Jefferson, and the cast included Thomas Chalmers, Carl Swenson, Joan Wetmore, Bernard Lenro, Guy Sorrell, Ann Seymour, Eric Dressler, Walter Grise, Doris Dalton, William Podmore, Charles Webster, Gavin Gordon, Bert Cowlin, and others. Next week... April 9th, 1865, Lee and Grant at Appomattox. You are there. Next this afternoon, great music comes your way from the New York Philharmonic Symphony. This evening, great comedy with Amos and Andy, now exclusively on CBS, and with Hollywood star comedian Eve Arden, your favorite school teacher. In Our Miss Brooks. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Declaration of Independence, a public domain recording for LibriVox.org, read by Jim Cadwell. The Declaration of Independence of the Thirteen Colonies, in Congress, July 4th, 1776. The Unanimous Declaration of the Thirteen United States of America. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, 
laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government, and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records, for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly, for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offences, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, 
for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably disrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation, and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. The National Broadcasting Company, in conjunction with the Fund for Adult Education, presents Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. Well, Tocqueville, what are you thinking about as you stare at these picturesque shores? Are you thinking about America? About America? No. I do not see America. I see more than America. I am trying to make out the image of democracy itself, with its inclinations, its prejudices, and its passions. Where could I be better off? A study in Jacksonian America. Item one in the series Democracy in America. Prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. 
a series designed to bring to life the America of 1831, as recorded by Alexis de Tocqueville, and so to illuminate the image of democracy itself. A study in Jacksonian America, where could I be better off? month of May, 1831, the president, Old Hickory, General Andrew Jackson. And this is New York City. Over 200,000 people live here. Across the clear, fresh water of the East River, we look at Brooklyn, New York's dairy, a countryside of breezy heights and pasture land and cows. And looking across the beach is a New York clam dealer in an orange check waistcoat, tight-fitting gray gaiters, and a plug hat as tall and stately as a belfry with rips in the sides as if to let the noise of the bells out. Clams, choice clams, here's your Rockaway Beach clams, fine sand clams. But his mind is on the New York Consolidated Lottery. To be had in the greatest variety of lucky numbers at Arnold, 313 Broadway, opposite the Masonic Hall. Ten years ago, the state legislature had forbidden the famous old New York lotteries, but the proprietors are still finding loopholes to satisfy their customers who swarm through the bright May streets to produce the busiest community that any man could desire to live in. (laughs) In the streets, all is hurry and bustle. The very carts, instead of being drawn by horses at a walking pace, are often met at a gallop and always in a brisk trot. Omnibuses are racketing and terry-hooting through the New York streets with as much hubbub, hullabaloo, and general unmitigated uproar as the most optimistic man might expect in a city seven times the size. Get up there, team! Get up, team! Out of the way there, mister! One side, get up! It is May the 11th, 1831. And on the deck of the fine steamboat president, just coming into New York Harbor, there stand two young men, both well-dressed, although both seem very tired. They have been without sleep for some time. They are surrounded by luggage, and they glance back and forth the sights, as if they were strangers from another planet that had never seen the Earth before. They are strangers, come from France to see this curious new land that is supposed to be a democracy. This one, age 26, is Alexis Charles-Henri Clarel de Tocqueville, son of a French count. As for the harbor and the city itself, well, picture to yourself an attractively varied shoreline, the slopes covered by lawns and trees, in bloom right down to the water, and more than all that, an unbelievable multitude of country houses, big as boxes of candy. I am much struck by how convenient these little houses must be, and by the attractive air they give the countryside. Such is our impression of the city of New York. Beside young Mr. de Tocqueville stands his great friend, also a French nobleman, but three years older. This young man, wearing a cloak, is 29. His name is Gustave Auguste de la Bonniniere de Beaumont. At each instant, you glimpse great bays which cut into the shores and form the most picturesque sides. We were full of real admiration. What struck us particularly was the animation given this majestic tableau by the immense number of vessels, brigs, gondolas, and boats of all kinds which cross and recross in every direction. Tocqueville and Beaumont plunge into the crowd as though into a bath and are lost in the tumult of activity and motion. The carriages rattle through the streets, the carts dance as if they were running races with them, and the ladies trip along in all the colors of the rainbow. Lord, Mabel, skip into that door right smart, or I declare that carriage is going to splash our skirt. <laughs> and as for the passers-by, they look as though they actually had something to do. Now I tell you what it is. Pardon me. I'm going to let you in on the ground floor of this development. I'm going to let you, excuse me, take an option in the purchase of some real first-rate, pardon me, Western Pennsylvania speculations. Basically, it's a granite quarry, uh, pardon, which can Watch be... Watch where you're going. Ma'am, I'm sorry. So am I. Now, basically, like I say, the investment is a granite quarry that's financing an India rubber company, all, excuse me, joint stock, and all enterprise, all pure enterprise, excuse me, if you want to make money... Now... Everybody is walking as if he were in a hurry. Well, if you want to find your way around this country, you'll have to hurry. We firmly believe that if a man means business, he better look as if he meant business. We Americans are born in a hurry and educated at speed. We make a fortune with a wave of a wand and lose it just as fast, and then remake and relose the whole thing in a twinkling of an eye. Our body is a locomotive ripping along at 30 miles an hour. Our spirit is a high-pressure engine. Our life resembles a shooting star, and death surprises us like an electric shock. 
The governor of the state of New York, Mr. Throop, looks through his boarding house window at everybody in motion and observes... They all seem as if they were running away from an indictment. And Governor Throop draws out a toothpick and continues to enjoy the May morning and watches the hogs happily rooting around in the gutters, indulging in hearty repasts of awful of every description. And this, too, in the midst of coaches, horses, and pedestrians. Cholera! That's what you're going to get? Cholera! That's what you're asking for right here in New York City. I wouldn't give you more than a dog's chance. Well, experience, sir, has proven that the most efficacious and powerful method of keeping the streets of a town in a state of perfect and refined cleanliness is plenty of hogs. And if the hogs aren't doing the trick, then you haven't got enough of them. Or in 1831, New York City, with its 200,000 people and 11 daily newspapers, is very unequal in style and quality from one district to another. The great avenue of Broadway is striking from its continuous and unbroken length of three miles in a straight line. But its breadth, about 80 feet, is not sufficiently ample for the due proportion to its length. It is, moreover, wretchedly paved. And as for 3rd Avenue and 8th Avenue, these are no more than long muddy lanes leading respectively to the remote villages of Harlem and Manhattanville. But New York is now and always has been a port, a city of ships. The sidewheel steamers with their long flaring funnels like post boys trumpets lie side by side with the forested sailing ships whose long bowsprits hang over the passers-by like sabers at a wedding. We must quickly find a boarding house and get some sleep. Do these people never stay still? Look how they chase along the streets. Everyone seems to be afraid to let the next man get ahead of him. And indeed, an American is always on the lookout lest any of his neighbors get the better of him. If 100 Americans were going to be shot, they would contend for the priority. So strong is our habit of competition. Look, Beaumont, over there. It must be some kind of parade. In the early 1830s, New York was a city of parades. Here's Major Downing. He calls himself a major from the state of Maine. He says he's from Maine, rode in one of those parades with the seventh president himself, Andrew Jackson himself, old hickory in person and none other. At least he says he did. I like to meet the man that had disbelieved me to my face with my glass in my hand. Uh, you tell him, Major. If you'd been out that day, you'd have seen me in the general figure in considerable large, I guess. There never was anything like it in New York before. I'll swear to that, Major. There's many an accomplished liar sitting outside the tavern drinking his whiskey and telling his stories, though certainly the great men are a great deal more accessible now in 1831 than they ever became later. One thing strikes me at once. What is that? Look at the people. Look at their general ease. Most of them seem well fed. Most of them seem well dressed. This is a country where men live well by the work of their hands. Irish laborers, straight off the boat, get as much as 75 cents a day. Together with lodging, three big meals a day, and six to eight glasses of whiskey, depending on the state of the weather. Bread, meat, sugar, tea, fuel are cheaper than in the old country, and wages are triple. The stores are full of things, some startling enough to horrify the casual visitor. We observe the open sale of Dirk's Bowie knives and a long kind of stiletto called the Arkansas toothpick. These are sold by druggists in whose shops or stores these deadly weapons are hung up for public inspection and sold by them as part of the legitimate wares of their calling, thus plainly indicating that weapons to kill, as well as medicine to cure, could be had at the same shop. <laughs> A city of green trees and fresh paint. A lively, new, sparkling city for all its roughness and vigor. Towards each other, the citizens are forthright and breezy, as when the clam dealer calls on the governor of the state. Hello there. Brought some fresh clams for the governor. Hey, sitting in the parlor, picking his teeth. Go right in. Hello there, Mr. Garrett. Step right in. Morning, Mr. Governor. Brought you some clams. Well, that's just fine. Pull up a chair and bite yourself off a chew. One man's as good as another, if not better, and people don't forget that elected officers are nothing but their servants. 
Towards women, however, the attitude is usually very different. There are no women around here. The females are ladies, should be treated accordingly, as the precious repositories and fair blossoms of virtue, beauty, and high morality. And anyone who suggests these dainty creatures should have their innocence sullied by too much education or the toil of commercial or political affairs deserves the act of opprobrium of all decent men. Equality and easy manners, then, and pride. Such pride. Boasting is a virtue, and a good boaster is a man to be admired. When the ancient, respectable, and patriotic Tammany Society celebrates its 42nd anniversary tomorrow, May 12th, I shall propose the toast to democracy, the finest institution devised by the mind of man, especially suited for the greatest people on earth, the fortunate inhabitants of the greatest country on earth, under God's special protection, America. Equality, boasting, and business. This is a city of merchants and men of affairs. Even in the streets full of hurrying people, business goes on as usual. I'll go 30 cents a pound. I can't cover the cost of shipping at that price. 32. That takes up all my profit. You do better than that now with your markup. There's overhead charges. 30 and a half. That's what I'll make it. 30 and a half. And yet, amid the bustle, there are some who sit calm. Like this old gentleman here with a white beard and whiskers and the clean-shaven top lip. He's reading the mercantile advertiser at the foot of Cortland Street and seems undisturbed by the bustle. Uh, what bustle? This is the 11th of May. You've been here the 1st of May, you've seen some bustle. Well, why the 1st of May? What's so special about that? Why, in New York City, the 1st of May is moving time. Well, how do you mean, moving time? Time, a uh, universal flitting. Time when everybody moves. People here are very locomotive in their habits. They are anxious to better themselves, you see. It's the day of all others in the year when the good people of this town have one and all agreed to play at the game of move all. First of May, they're all at it with all their might. Second of May, everything will be quiet. They'll all be settled again. Did you move the first of May? I most certainly did. I moved every May day for the last 40 years. Everybody does the same. People can't bear not to be like their neighbors. Or it takes a live fish to swim upstream. Well, good day, dear. Nice fresh day. And it is a nice fresh day, perhaps a little too fresh. For down here by the water, there's quite a wind. Look at that poor lady tacking along with the wind behind her skirts and flounces. A lady has a time of it when the wind blows and the dust is flying in clouds, as it does in New York almost all day long. I encountered a puff at the corner of one of the streets, and there I stood holding my hat with one hand and my cardinal cloak, which has 56 yards of various commodities in it, with the other. I thought I should have gone up like a balloon and stood stark still until I came near being run over by a great hog which was scampering away from some mischievous boys. At last, a sailor took compassion on me and set me down at the door of a store. As he went away, I heard him say to his companion, Damn my eyes, Bill. What a press of canvas the girls carry nowadays. This lady is not the only one to complain of the wind, for as we near the waterfront, we see the air full of plug hats and people chasing after them. Catch it! Catch it! Don't step on it, you confounded blockhead! But particularly notice this. See the pieces of paper sailing about, together with a variety of vegetables, pieces of linen and other materials, entirely interrupting the view. Where does all this come from? Is it garbage? No, sir, it is not. All those commodities come from hats. No nation on earth uses a hat for so many purposes as a Yankee. It serves him at once for a head covering, a writing desk, a larder, and a portmanteau. In it, the merchant deposits patterns of various descriptions. The doctor uses it as an apothecary shop. The married man, returning from market, converts it into a depository for potatoes and other vegetables. And to the traveler, it serves as a knapsack. Look, 66 Broadway, room for rent. A boarding house. Eighteen thirty-one. Now let me see. I was in New York City at the time. My husband had gone to his long reward. He used to work as a speculator, trading in commodities. You know, you can make a lot of money that way. He didn't, but he sure tried hard. A fine man. I guess that's what killed him. So I opened a refined boarding house for ladies and gentlemen of standing and position. Number 66 Broadway, just down the street from the American Hotel. 
These two French gentlemen came in off the steamship president, and I never saw two fellas look more tired. They just rolled into their beds in the middle of the afternoon, and I guess they must have slept clean through until 8 o'clock next morning, when I told Kitty to ring for breakfast. All right, Kitty. All the cold meats are on, and the lobster will be ready in a moment. Might as well let them have the gong as soon as it's 8 o'clock. Yes, ma'am. All right, Kitty, let them have it. <laughs> Morning, ma'am. Do any studying last night? I reckon I did. I've just about proved that the Babylon of the Apocalypse refers to the Scarlet City of London, England. Mr. Graves from Kentucky. Very keen Bible student, though just a piece biased about proving England's downfall. Good morning, Marquis. Good morning, madam. I hope you passed a good night, Marquis. In the wrongs of my unhappy country. Get the bag wig and the raffles. That gentleman's a real French marquis. That's the way they call it. I believe right now the marquis is teaching dancing to young ladies of refinement and... Morning, Major General. Morning, ma'am. You look fit as a fiddle this fine morning, sir. An old soldier usually comes out pretty fit, ma'am. The Major General's from Vermont. A regular walk-in encyclopedia about the war, if you ask me. Morning, Mr. O'Brien. Oh, morning, ma'am. One moment, Mr. O'Brien. I wondered if we might have something on account on that little bill. Well, I tell you, ma'am, I've got a job this morning at the Hudson River docks checking consignments. And whatever I get, you can have half of it. No, you can't say fairer than that. I'd rather have the whole of it. But you can't say too much to the poor fella with his ribs all sticking out. He has to stand up twice to cast a shadow. A lot of Irish gentlemen are over here to live cheap even though it cost them a year's wages to get here. Morning, Mr. Beasley. Morning, ma'am. Any luck yesterday? I thought I saw one of them over near the courthouse, but it gave me the slip. Well, I hope and trust you have better luck today. Mr. Beasley is from the Carolinas, indigo planter. He's up here on business and keeping his eye open for half a dozen of his slaves that ran away. He's heard tell they're in New York City at present. I hope he can make those slaves realize that every time they run away, they deprive a gentleman of his lawful property. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, madame. Good morning. Now, let me see. Which of you gentlemen is which? I am Mr. de Tocqueville, and this is Mr. de Beaumont. Mr. Tocqueville's the little one. Mr. Beaumont's the big one. Well, I, I hope I can remember that. And you gentlemen are from France? That is perfectly correct. Well, you can't start the day on an empty stomach. And you will if you don't step lively. Why, it must be five past eight if it's a minute. The gong here goes at eight o'clock, you know. And I wouldn't answer for there being many vittles on the board by a quarter after. Then we had better hurry. Sit wherever you like. If there's any left, there's fish, ham, beef, boiled fowls, eggs, pigeons, pumpkin pies, lobsters... Vegetables, tea, coffee, cider, sangaree, and cherry brandy. Oh, uh, we, we, we can sit here. Yes. Uh, uh, beef? Thank you. Potatoes? Thank you. Cabbage? No, thanks. Coffee? No, not at this time in the morning. I'll have brandy. Beaumont, look at the ladies. It is also too early in the morning to look at ladies. No, no, I'm serious. You notice they are completely dressed for the day. Everything complete and finished. And here it is only breakfast. At this rate, a lady would be ready to receive visitors at nine o'clock in the morning. Things will be very different here in America. See how fast you must eat. This food is melting away before our eyes. And more beef. Thank you. Uh, more potatoes. Thank you. Oh, some of them are leaving already. Certainly there seems to be very little formality in a democracy. Then you and I shall gobble our breakfast as though we were Americans and hurry out to see the marvels of New York. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, where are we? This is the Bowery. And this is Bayard Street. Now, look at that hotel. 
The North American Hotel. One, two, three, four, five floors. And an exchange table Never attached. mind that. Look at the roof. What I want you to notice Could is... I do that... mind it. I want to notice everything and make, make no, a note. Look on the roof beside where the American flag is flying. Huh? There is a wooden statue of a poor boy with ragged knees and elbows. Oh. Now, why should the management put such a thing on their roof? Surely there must be some instructive story connected with it. Yes, sir, Ooh. there surely is. Ooh, and you'll find it's a tale of American industry, American opportunity, and American courage. Are those things abundant here? Sir, those virtues and many others besides are always found in America and never found in other countries. <clears throat> now, sir, 38 years ago, a poor boy came to this town, a poor Yankee boy. Name of David Reynolds. He was 12 or 14 years of age at the time, without a crust of bread to feed him, without a copper in his pocket. Weary and hungry, he leaned against a fine elm tree, since cut down, made into lumber, and sold at a good price. That elm tree stood where the North American Hotel now stands. While young David Reynolds was leaning against it, luxuriating, you might say, in his beautiful shade, he racked his little brains to try and devise some means of procuring for the sustenance of his childish needs a livelihood that should be both honest and honorable. While he was thus reflecting how to get his dinner, a gentleman came up to him... Name? Uh, I beg your pardon, sir. I wondered if you knew this gentleman's name. <clears throat> this gentleman's name, sir, has not been handed down to posterity. Oh. May I proceed? Pray do. Thank you, sir. The gentleman, whose name has not been transmitted to us, approached this poor friendless boy and asked if he were willing to carry the gentleman's trunk down to the wharf. The boy eagerly consented and received for his labors the sum of 25 cents. Now, what do you suppose he did with it? Spent it on food. Perhaps he reserved some to pay for his night's lodging. Or was he prepared to sleep in the street? He was prepared to do anything, sir, providing it was honest. I'll tell you what he did. He did an American thing. With a little of the money, he bought food. And with the rest of it, he bought fruit, which he offered for sale beneath that same elm tree. American initiative, sir, grasping the opportunity. He soon disposed of his little stock to advantage and spent that night richer than he had ever been before. On the morrow, he repeated the transaction. Soon, he had a fruit stall under the tree, then a small shop, then several houses on either side. Finally, he acquired such an estate that he pulled it all down and built this magnificent hotel. On this plaque, which he caused to be erected, he has set out his own story. And you will perceive it concludes with these words. The tree was cut down, but from its beloved trunk he caused his image to be carved. That's it up there. As a memento of his own forlorn beginnings and his grateful recollections. From a penniless, ragged boy, David Reynolds rose to be one of the most prosperous citizens in his community and the owner of the finest hotel in New York City. And possibly the world. That, sir, is an American story. And I myself am David Reynolds at your service. Sir, I am enchanted to make your acquaintance. Delighted. But tell me this. Do not your fellow citizens hold against you in some way these humble origins of yours? <laughs> they do not, sir. Most emphatically not. I am a man of property and position. And in New York, that speaks for itself. Oh, uh, I trust, by the way, gentlemen, that you are yourselves not in need of lodgings, because if you are... No, thank I, you, uh... sir. We are already accommodated. And in any case, we must very shortly leave the city. We hear New York is not America, and we want to see all the country. You should see it all. The finest country in the world. Ask any American, and he'll tell you, where could I be better off? Goodbye, gentlemen, and remember that little American story. I think he is right. That is an American story. A poor boy rising to be a large property owner, enjoying the respect of his community. But chiefly because of his money. Perhaps it is the symbol of position. 
as blood is with us. This is indeed a new world. And one to which we had better become accustomed. I am going to find out about this place, Beaumont, because I think in this country we can perceive something of the future of our own. Democracy? Yes. America is only my setting. Democracy is my subject. It appears to me, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that sooner or later we shall arrive, like the Americans, at an almost complete equality of condition. But first, we must collect the facts. We must dissect American society and search out the elements of which it is composed. We must ask useful questions. The smallest conversations will be instructive. There is not a man, on whatever rung of society he finds himself, who cannot teach me something. You have just heard, Where Could I Be Better Off? A Study in Jacksonian America. Item one in a series based on Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. This series, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, was prepared by the Division of General Education of New York University under the direction of George Probst, American historian. Produced in the studios of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation by Andrew Allen, script by Lister Sinclair, music by Lucio Agostini. This series, Democracy in America, is made possible by a grant from the Fund for Adult Education as part of a general course of study of the nature of American society. For information about the use of these de Tocqueville dramatizations for study or discussion and how to secure these new materials about American democracy at a reasonable charge, write to the American Foundation for Continuing Education, Post Office Box 749, Chicago 90, Illinois. Now this is Ben Grower inviting you to join us next week for item two, the governor in the boarding house on democracy in America. Wherever you travel in the USA, stay well informed. Tune to Radio NBC. Independence has emerged here on this fourth evening of July 1776, an opponent strong enough to rally the latent opposition to separation from the mother country. Mr. John Dickinson, Pennsylvania's leading delegate to the Continental Congress, has just told reporters that he intends to speak on the floor before the final vote is taken. This in a supreme effort to block this declaration, which would commit our 13 colonies to revolutionary war with England. Mr. Dickinson agreed that he is staking his political future on the outcome of the vote. He anticipates that if he fails to block passage of the Declaration of Independence, he will be ejected from the Congress and be... July 4th, 1776, the State House in Philadelphia. You are there. John Dickinson, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson... CBS takes you back to the evening when the colonial leaders fought their showdown battle on the issue of independence from England, with the fate of a continent hanging in the balance. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You are there is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, July 4th, 1776, the Philadelphia State House and John Daly. During the recess, which is now officially over, we hurried from the end of this microphone here on the floor of the Congress to bring you this news. 
Mr. Dickinson has not arrived yet. He should be along at any minute, but meanwhile, the news has preceded him and it's having an explosive effect on the delegates who are present. As a matter of fact, the weather isn't helping things either. It's very hot here in Philadelphia tonight, and in their heavy waistcoats, ruffles, and wigs, the delegates in the hall are perspiring profusely. Even more irritating are the horse flies from a nearby stable which come in through the open windows. These flies are nasty, so much so that Mr. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, the author of the declaration, has said that it is not at all unlikely that this debate will be ended not by sharp logic of the delegates, but by the even sharper bite of the horse flies. Major George Fielding Elliott has been talking to the delegates and is now ready with his analysis of the possibilities inherent in Mr. Dickinson's announcement. So I switch you now to our CBS headquarters booth here in the Congress. Come in, Major Elliott. Mr. Dickinson's views carry great weight here. His announcement therefore comes as a shock to those delegates who want the Declaration of Independence passed. Mr. John Adams from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, leader of the Independence Party, had hoped the Declaration would go through unanimously, but that's no longer possible. Indeed, the declaration may not even pass. Mr. Adams and Mr. Dickinson personify the present political conflict. Mr. Adams is the son of a Massachusetts lawyer. He was educated for the law in New England. He agrees with the men who dumped the East India Company's tea into Boston Harbor. Although Mr. Adams prides himself on being a plain man, the delegates regard him as arrogant and intolerant of all who differ with his views. Mr. Dickinson, on the other hand, was born to wealth. He received his education at London Middle Temple. He has a mild, amiable, sincere manner. He opposes independence because of his conviction that all political injustices can be righted by legal methods without recourse to violence or revolution. Just a moment. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson have entered the hall. So, back to John Daly. Mr. Jefferson! Mr. Jefferson! Yes? Mr. Jefferson, you've heard the news that Mr. Dickinson will speak against independence. May we have your comment? I... I have the greatest respect for Mr. Dickinson's courage and integrity. Mr. Adams and I wish we could say as much for his political judgment. This Congress, sir, is in no mood for any more of Mr. Dickinson's temporizing. In the course of this debate, the delegates have learned to know Mr. Dickinson for what he is. A spineless aristocrat at best... At worst, an agent of the enemy. Well, Mr. Adams, we're very glad to have your comment also. Are you accusing Mr. Dickinson of being in the pay of the British? I hardly think Mr. Adams is intended any... If you please, Mr. Jefferson. Sir, Mr. Dickinson has consistently sabotaged the work of this body by fallacious appeals to reason and by parliamentary devices, but no more of that. The Declaration of Independence will be put to a vote as soon as President Hancock arrives and calls this meeting to order. And I am confident that the gentleman will be unable to sway the Congress from the course on which it is now well launched. Thank you, Mr. Adams and Mr. Jefferson. The delegates are taking their seats. And as you must have gathered from Mr. Adams' remarks, the long, smoldering enmity between him and Mr. Dickinson has finally flared out into the open. The debate, when he and Dickinson clash on the floor, promises to be more violent than any this Congress has heard in the two years since it's been in existence. Mr. Dickinson has just entered the hall, and he has to pass our microphone. He's coming this way now. Mr. Dickinson, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. sir. Mr. Dickinson, Mr. John Adams has just called you an agent of the enemy, Mr. Dickinson. Would you care Mr. to make... Mr. Adams considers anyone who differs with him to be an agent of the enemy. But I cannot allow myself to be silenced by insults. The question is, shall our colonies declare themselves independent of the mother country? And on this question, my opponents have been utterly dishonest. Will you explain that, Mr. Dickinson? Certainly will. Eleven times in the past two years, Congress pledged itself not to seek independence. In January of this year, only six months ago, the Congress passed a most solemn declaration to the effect that we Americans have no thought of setting up an independent nation. And now, tonight, Mr. Adams asks us to break our pledged word. Nay, he demands it. But if the people favor independence, Mr. Dickinson, I... Mr. Adams has confused the people. He has engineered coup d'etats in the provincial legislatures in order to pack, to pack this Congress with delegates favoring independence. He has organized gangs of hoodlums 
to roam the streets of the cities and towns, attacking those who oppose revolution. But isn't it true, Mr. Dickinson, that at least 50% of the population favors independence? Is it right for one half of the population to impose its views on the other half by terror? Can these colonies hope to achieve victory in a revolutionary war when half of the people oppose it? I predict that if the Congress passes the Declaration of Independence, the result will be civil war, useless bloodshed, and ruinous defeat. True. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Dickinson. The delegate from Pennsylvania is walking to his seat now. Mr. John Hancock, the president of the Congress, has entered the chamber, but it will very probably be a few moments yet before he calls the Congress to order. Mr. Dickinson said that a considerable portion of the people are opposed to independence. Well, Ken Roberts is outside the State House, where a representative crowd of Philadelphians are awaiting the result of the vote. So let's find out what they think about independence. Go ahead, Ken Roberts. With me at our CBS microphone is Mrs. Agnes Hatcher, who lives on Water Street. Mrs. Hatcher, do you favor separation from England? I hate separation. My husband was killed fighting for separation. Oh, I'm sorry. It's John Adams that should be sorry, and Mr. Jefferson. Why don't they make peace and end this killing? But, Mrs. Hatcher, would you want peace at any price? Will you tell me why my husband should die at Boston fighting the Bay Colony's battles? If the men of New England have a quarrel with the British, let them do the fighting and dying themselves. But Mr. Adams and Mr. Jefferson say they want freedom for all the colonies. I don't care about freedom. My husband is dead. Thank you, Mrs. Hatcher. Now, here beside me is Mr. Richard Caswell, an importer in Philadelphia. I forgot to ask you, Mr. Caswell, what do you import? The finest of English woolen, sir. The very finest. Oh, I see. And do you favor independence? This, this... What are you using, Mr. Caswell? A dispatch rider has just ridden up at the State House... His horse is lathered and covered with dust and sweat. It looks as if he's been ridden long and hard. Where are you from, soldier? New York. General Washington's headquarters. What's the news there? What's happening? Plenty of excitement. Wait a minute. Wait. What's going on? The rider has gone into the state house. Whatever the news is, our reporters inside will bring it to you as soon as it's released. I'm sorry about that interruption, Mr. Caswell. Quite all right. Quite all right. You were about to tell me whether you favored independence. It's an illusion, sir. Independent from what? How can we be independent? We're Englishmen. My family's English. They're all in England. Or my trade, my business is with England. Look at my books, you see. This talk about separation is ridiculous. Worse than ridiculous. It's, it's vicious. It, it, it's ruining me. Ever since this war started, no shipments. No shipments. Percentages. 76% less business than my firm did in 75. But, Mr. Caswell, isn't it argued that if the colonies were independent, American businessmen could then trade with the entire world? Who wants to trade with the entire world? What do we need the world for? Everything we can produce, we can sell in England. And everything that we need, we can buy from England. It's just common sense, that's all. How do you suppose the colonies have grown prosperous and, and strong and important? Protected trade with England. Protected trade. Yes, but what about the heavy taxes that the mother country has imposed? What about taxation without representation? Uh, bad, bad, very bad. But independence, worse, much worse, terrible. What about Pitt and Burke in Parliament? We have friends in England. They're trying to settle this thing intelligently, without violence, without bloodshed. But Mr. Adams and Jefferson, those, those wild men in there, hotheads, radicals, that's what they are. They want to get power, that's all power. That's all they're interested in, power. But Mr. Caswell, independence is independence something... Independence that... the worst second. Listen to him. We've oh, already become friend. independent of principle and gratitude to the mother country. What did he say? Uh, and mm -hmm. if, this, if this war is permitted to continue, we shall become independent of cash, clothing, laws, liberty, and... Yes, yes, life itself. What are you talking about? about? You're a liar, that's what you are, mister. You're a Tory. A Tory. Tory. The truth. It may not be popular, but it's the truth. Shut up, you Tory. I will pick your weapon. I'm not afraid of you. This will close your mouth. Ah, ah. Hit him. Captain, Hit him. just struck by the man who's been heckling him. The crowd here is manhandling Mr. Caswell. The men are flailing at him with their fists. They must be members of the Sons of Liberty. The women are tearing at Mr. Caswell's clothes, spitting at him. This crowd has gone wild and it's frightening. Mr. Caswell has been knocked to the ground. I can't see him, but I can hear his cries. The men are bending over him, swinging their fists, pounding. This is John Daly inside the Continental Congress. We have interrupted Ken Roberts because President Hancock has just called the Congress to order. He's about to read the dispatch which has just arrived from General Gentlemen, Washington's headquarters in New York. President this is Hancock. The information contained in General Washington's dispatch. 
The news is grim indeed. A great British fleet is at this moment in New York Harbor. British Marines have seized Staten Island in the harbor, and red coats are landing there by the thousands. General Washington advises that a British attack on New York City must be expected momentarily. The enemy appears to have overwhelming superiority in numbers and equipment. General Washington concludes with a statement that it may be impossible to defend New York City with the slender forces at his command. Gentlemen, the Congress will recess for five minutes. The Congress has again recessed. The sound of President Hancock's gavel has released a torrent of excitement and confusion bordering virtually on panic. Delegates have risen from their seats. They are moving about the floor, talking to each other in loud voices, often shouting in their arguments. Mr. John Adams and Mr. Thomas Jefferson have rushed up to the chair. Mr. Adams is pale, agitated. Only Mr. Dickinson, of all the delegates here in the chamber, has remained seated. Mr. Rutledge! Just a moment, sir. Here's Mr. Edward Rutledge, a delegate from South Carolina. Sir, what effect do you think the news of the British arrival will have on the independence vote? It cannot fail to have a profound effect. It will add force and logic to Mr. Dickinson's position. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Mr. Rutledge is one of Mr. Dickinson's supporters. Here is Mr. Elbridge Gerry, a delegate from the Massachusetts Bay Colony and an independence man. Mr. Gerry, what do you think of the announcement, sir? Uh, frankly, I, I don't know what to think. Mr. Dickinson may well argue now that the Declaration of Independence may not be worth the paper it's written on. Uh, but we must keep our head. We must stand first. Thank you, Mr. Gary. Major Elliott has more news from New York, so let's switch to him in our CBS headquarters booth. Come in, Major Elliott. We now know that the British fleet numbers 130 vessels. The troops on board are commanded by General Sir William Howe, one of England's ablest generals. The appearance of the fleet has thrown New York into disorderly confusion, and the legislature has withdrawn for safety to White Plains, 35 miles away. Our New York newsroom informs us that a short while ago, CBS correspondent Ned Calmer passed through the British lines on Staten Island under safe conduct to interview the British commander-in-chief. He made a tape recording of this interview that our New York newsroom will play for you now. This is the kitchen of a Staten Island farmhouse which now serves as General Howe's headquarters. A regiment of redcoats is on parade outside, marching to the music of a British military band. I can see them through an open window from where I'm standing. In their tight-fitting scarlet coats and long gaiters, these trim soldiers in perfect step to the music look like the veteran fighting men that they are. General Howe, sir, will you tell us how many such troops you have at your disposal? 14,000 on this island, and an additional 13,000 under General Carlton on their way across Lake Champlain in Upper New York. You don't mind giving General Washington this information? But, not at all, not at all. Frankly, I doubt very much that it will make any difference if Washington knows it. I take it then, General Howe, that you're completely confident of victory. Naturally. Those men you see out there, they are the conquerors of France and Spain. They're the finest troops in the world. They'll crush Washington's colonial militiamen at the very first encounter, utterly. But Washington, poor fellow, he's leading nothing but a rabble. They lack powder, guns. His officers are without experience. Washington himself is hardly what you might call, shall we say, a professional military man. General Washington, sir, made quite a good showing in the war against the French. Under English commanders, Mr. Calmer. Calmer. Under English commanders, Mr. Calmer. Calmer. General Howe, you know, of course, that the Continental Congress is about to vote on independence from England. Would you care to comment on that, sir? Yes, yes, I would like to say something to that. I would like to say it as a friend and not as a soldier. I repeat, as a friend, because I think I have amply demonstrated my friendship for British America in the past by word and deed. Yes, if I recall correctly, General Howe, you once stated publicly that you would never lead British troops against British America. Of course, of course, of course but... The situation has changed. The colonies are now being led by a pack of extremists. This rebellion by the mob must be crushed. And I have the forces with which to crush it. The greatest fleet and the most powerful force of soldiers ever assembled on American soil. I, uh, I hope with all my heart that it will not be necessary to throw this array of military power into action. 
I pray that the counsel of the extremists will be rejected by the Continental Congress and that the advice of saner, more moderate men will prevail. Thank you, General Howe. This is George Fielding Elliott in Philadelphia. The interview you have just heard was a tape recording made by Ned Calmer at British headquarters on Staten Island. The recess here in the Continental Congress continues. The delegates are confused, shaken. Mr. Adam, Mr. Jefferson, and Mr. Benjamin Franklin, the leaders of the Independent Party, are doing all they can to counteract the doubt and hesitation inspired by the news from New York. They are trying desperately to maintain their strength, to keep their pledged votes in line, and they are insisting that the final vote be taken tonight without regard for the situation in New York. On the other hand, a group of less militant delegates is urging postponement until we have more definite information from General Washington's headquarters. The commander-in-chief said in his dispatch that he fears that he may not be able to hold New York. The cautious delegates want to know for sure whether he will fight or surrender the city without a struggle. Our CBS correspondent, Bud Collier, is now at General Washington's headquarters. He may have some last-minute information. Therefore, we take you now to General Washington's headquarters in New York, Bud Collier reporting. I'm waiting here on the parade ground before General Washington's headquarters. The commander-in-chief has promised to answer my question as soon as he comes out to address his troops, presumably to make some formal statement about the news of the British arrival. The bugles are blowing assembly. The men of the regiments are running to join their formations. I can see the flag of the 1st Massachusetts, I believe it is, the Virginia Rifles, the 5th Connecticut, and many others. But in all this mass of thousands of men, I see very few men in uniform. Most of the troops are dressed in civilian homespun, and quite a few of them wear the fringed leather shirts which mark them as frontiersmen. General Washington has still not come out on the parade ground. Oh, here's a militiaman coming by. Soldier, soldier. Oh, hi, let me go. I got four. Oh, ju just a few questions. You've got plenty of time. But, but I, What's I, your name, son? Look, uh, Tom Summers. Look, let me go, will you, mister? The sergeant will give me all... That's all right. I'll fix it with General Washington for you. How old are you, Tom? Uh, Seventeen. Uh-huh. Ever seen any action against the British? No, no, not yet. Well, you'll probably see action soon right here in New York. Well, I ain't afraid, if that's what you mean. How long have you been in the Army, Tom? Uh, two, two months. Look, please, mister, ask me all your questions at once. All right, it? Tom, sure. How long are you in for? Well, I'm going back home next month. That's when my three months are up. Oh? Uh, my pa enlisted me. He wanted to make himself $10. I see. Well, he got his $10, and I'm going home next month. Uh-huh. Well, there ain't nothing wrong with that, you know. No. Some fellas enlisted for the money and then deserted without even serving their three months. Well, yes, but uh, what about independence, Tom? How do you feel about independence? Well, I, I don't know nothing about that, honest, mister. I, oh, there's the general. I gotta go. General Washington is approaching the microphone. He wears his full-dress uniform. His sword flaps against the side of his leg as he walks. General Washington, are you going to fight for New York? It is a difficult question. Frankly, I haven't made up my mind. If you elect to fight General Washington, do you think you will be able to defend New York successfully? I will do my best, and God willing, we shall be successful. In any event, I would like to say to all the people, do not yield to panic. But General, in view of the current situation, do you think the Declaration of Independence should be passed at this time? That must be decided by the Congress in Philadelphia. Thank you, General Washington. The Commander-in-Chief is walking away across the field now, his shoulders slightly bent, his jaw thrust forward in the manner of a man who bears an enormous responsibility for which he is ill-prepared. This is Bud Collier in New York. I return you now to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. This is John Daly of the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. This is the long-awaited climax of the debate on the Declaration of Independence. The Congress has reconvened, and because Mr. Dickinson asked to speak against the Declaration, Mr. Adams has also requested the floor. By agreement, the vote will take place when the two speakers have finished. Also, by agreement, before the session began, Mr. Adams is speaking first. He's exerting his utmost efforts to keep the votes pledged to independence from voting to Mr. Dickinson. Will he succeed? Well, we'll only know when the vote is taken. And now let's listen to Mr. Adams. By proclaiming a declaration of independence, gentlemen, this Congress 
will be giving official recognition to a fact which already exists, namely that these colonies are actually, in fact, independent of England. Yet, some great brains counsel us to wait, to exercise caution. Do these cautious gentlemen plead for a postponement of a declaration of independence so that their Tory friends may have time to hatch plots and conspiracies against us? Gentlemen, to delay is to play into the hands of the enemy, defeating the cause for which so much blood has already been shed. There must be no further delay. The people are ready. The people wait for the Congress to lead them. The hour has struck. The Congress must proceed now to a vote, an affirmative vote, on the Declaration of Independence. Mr. Adams has left the rostrum. Mr. Dickinson is coming up to speak. Dickinson's face is pale, his fists are clenched. He's clearly marshalling all of his strength for a supreme effort to oratory. He's waiting now for the Congress to come to order. Mr. Dickinson. Mr. President, I accuse my opponents of cynicism. They do not, they cannot believe that these colonies will be able to endure as independent states. Their true goal is not independence. They exploit indignation against the mother country to further their own personal fortune. Mr. President, my opponents make their appeal to the emotions. I make my appeal to intelligence and logic. Mr. President, British troops are on Staten Island in overwhelming force. They are about to attack New York. General Washington's task will be difficult at best, but a declaration of independence now will serve only to divide the people of New York and make the defense of that city hopeless. Pass the declaration and you will set brother against brother father against son. The colonies will become not only the scene of warfare with a mother country, but civil war as well. And in the bloody, senseless, fratricidal struggle, there is no possibility of success. Proclaim independence this evening, gentlemen, and you gain nothing. You merely invite the whirlwind of destruction. I urge you to vote against it. I beg, I plead, I beseech you, vote against, against independence. <laughs> Mr. Dickinson's plea has been received without applause. The delegates are calling the question, and there seems to be no objection. Oh, but wait a minute. Several of the delegates have risen. However, they're not going to ask for the floor. These delegates are leaving the hall. Four, five... There go three more. Others are leaving also, and I can recognize some of them as men who have been openly undecided. Apparently, they're unwilling to vote, caught on the horns of a dilemma, swayed, no doubt, both by Mr. Adams and Mr. Dickinson. This is a great, a fearful moment of decision. Some of these men are apparently not capable of facing up to it. President Hancock. Embodying the Declaration of Independence. The vote will be by colonies. Each colony voting as a unit. A majority will decide. The club will call the roll. Twelve votes will be cast. New York has decided to abstain. Thus, seven votes will carry the issue. New Hampshire, Mr. Josiah Bartlett. New Hampshire votes unanimously for independence. Massachusetts, Mr. John Adams. The Patriots of Massachusetts. Vote unanimously for independence. Rhode Island, Mr. William Ellery. Independence. Connecticut, Mr. Roger Sherman. Independence, unanimous. New Jersey, the Reverend Dr. Witherspoon. Mr. President, in my judgment, 
the country is not only ripe for independence, but is in danger of becoming rotten for want of it. New Jersey votes unanimously for independence. Pennsylvania, Mr. Benjamin Franklin. The majority of the delegation from Pennsylvania votes for separation from England, so help us God. Delaware, Mr. Caesar Rodney. Delaware votes unanimously for independence. The Declaration of Independence is that Delaware has Thomas cast the deciding Stone. vote. There is no reaction from the delegates, and the voting continues. It will very probably be unanimous by colonies. Many of the individual delegates are shaking their heads. However, no matter what may be said against the Declaration, this document is impressive. It reads well. It begins, when in the course of human events, change is necessary, and then continues, and I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. July 4th, 1776, deriving their John Dickinson loses his fight to block the Declaration of Independence, and the 13 colonies go forward to establish the United States of America. is presented during the full hour ahead by the Philco Corporation, makers today of electronic battle equipment for the fighting forces of the United Nations, makers tomorrow of equipment for good living in a free world united by victory. Cooperating with Philco are the editors and correspondents of Variety, who report for the Philco program all the news of all show business the world over every week. This week, the editors of Variety recommend for your pleasure... And Philco delights to honor in your name. From radio, Fred Allen with Portland Hopper and the entire Allen Company. From opera, the celebrated metropolitan tenor, Laurence Melchior. From the Broadway stage, Lou Holtz, master storyteller, and Raymond Edward Johnson, substituting for Orson Welles to bring you a New Year's message written by Stephen Vincent Benet. From the popular music field, Helen Forrest. Conducting the Hall of Fame Orchestra and Chorus, Paul Whiteman. Our master of ceremonies, the distinguished composer, critic, and commentator, Deems Taylor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Deems Taylor speaking for Phil Call. You know, if we could transport the members of our cast directly to your homes today, in person, you'd have the makings of quite a remarkable pre-New Year's party. Well, that's what we hope that our broadcast turns out to be. With Fred Allen, Portland Hoffa, and Lou Holtz taking care of laughter, Doritz Melchior and Helen Forrest attending to the song department, and Raymond Edward Johnson lending a serious note to our year's end proceedings. Said proceedings open with a slightly daring piece of musical impertinence on the part of Paul Whiteman. Most New Year's parties end with Auld Lang Syne. Paul has chosen to make this traditional finale into a rousing overture. Beginning, Paul, at once.
Uh, speaking of old acquaintance, there's Lou Holtz. Lou is a producer now at Metro Golden Mayor. Before plunging Kane first into a ten weeks shooting schedule on the new movie version of the Ziegfeld Follies, he's enjoying a busman's holiday at the Capitol Theater on Broadway. In other words, he's back at his old trade, making people laugh. For our uh, New Year's program, Philco has asked Lou to reach back into his inexhaustible bag of tricks for a couple or so of typical Holt stories, including a continuation of the immortal saga of Sam Lapidus, a gentleman who surely belongs in the Hall of Fame. Enter Lou Holtz. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to be back here in New York. I've been away a year. The first thing I did as soon as I got in town, I ran over to my draft board. First thing, they said, Lou, we have put you in 73 F's. See? And I said, what is 73 F's? And they said, a single man with furniture. I've been traveling all over the country. I've been down south. I was down in Texas. I must tell you this. I met a chap in Texas, a Hebraic chap. And uh, you've heard you've heard a lot of actors come out on the stage. They make up a lot of fictitious names for Hebraic gentlemen like DeWitt Clinton Fink <laughs> or Throckmorton Abramowitz, <laughs> Lilani Levine. <laughs> there are no such people. <laughs> but down in Texas, there's a guy. This is the end of all those names. This fellow's name is Honeysuckle Epstein. <laughs> Honeysuckle has a mania for driving fast in, in an automobile. He's been arrested a score of times. He's been in jail. So finally got an idea. He got himself a car made that would go 175 miles an hour. The car was delivered to him. He got in the car, and he went out on the road looking for cops. <laughs> he sees a cop that's arrested him eight or nine times. He's shot by this cop 90 miles an hour. The cop on the motorcycle right after him. And when he got within about 15 yards of Honeysuckle, he gave a little more gas up to about 125. Now the cop is going after him all his might, and when the cop got near him the second time, he gave a little more gas, up to about 145. Now he's going a little too fast for the cop, so he slowed up a little bit, you see? He's monkeying around with the law. When the cop got near him the third time, he gave it all he had, 175 miles an hour down the road, he's gone. He's down the road eight or nine miles, looks around, He's lost the cop, so he said, now I'll turn around and give it to him on the way back. <laughs> Comes back down the road, he's looking for the cop, he finds him underneath a tree, his nose is broken, he's bleeding, his motorcycle is wrecked. Well, he was a wreck. He looked like he'd been hit by a train. Honeysuckle stops the car, turns the cop, he says, son, see, what happened to you? See, what happened to you, boy? Well, the cop says, you know, when I got near you that third time, when you pulled away from me so fast, I thought my motorcycle had stopped, so I got off to see what was wrong with it. <laughs> There's an Irishman, an Irishman who lives in Brooklyn. His name is Sullivan. Now, this is an Irish story, a little out of my line, but say, I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan lives in Brooklyn, and he's in this country about four weeks. He's walking down the street, and he finds $245 in a purse on the sidewalk. He looks at it. He says, this is the most fantastic thing I've ever seen in my life. The most amazing thing is this gold in the sidewalk. Fantastic. The most fantastic thing I've ever heard of. What a land! What a land! He says it's fantastic! He sees a streetcar. He gets on the streetcar for the first time. He's in the streetcar about five minutes. The car has gone about six blocks. And the conductor hollers out, Myrtle! And a woman got off. <laughs> he says, what a land! The most fantastic! Thing I've ever heard of in my life. It's fantastic. How did he know her name? It's amazing. They ride about five more blocks, the conductor hollers out, Marty, and another woman got off. He 
Jesus, what an organization. Fantastic. The most fantastic thing. They go about six more blocks. The conductor hollers out, Sullivan. He says, that's me. He gets off. He's walking up the street. And a nice old lady walked up to him. She says, I beg your pardon. Is this Sullivan? He says, it is. She said, I'm looking for 245, and he handed her the purse. <laughs> I bumped into my old friend Sam Lapidus. Lapidus is walking down Park Avenue. He passes a very high tone place. On Park Avenue, they call him Salon. Salon. Plain saloon. <laughs> Walks in for the first time, walks up to the bartender, and says, Hi, shorty. Hi, old timer. Hi, Spunky. He says, I'll have a highball. He says, Hold it, hold it. I think I'll take a capsule. One capsule. The bartender handed him a cocktail. He gave the bartender a dollar. He's sipping slowly, awaiting the change. No changes forthcoming. He says to the bartender, oh, Shorty, Shorty. He says, there's a difference between you and me from 35 cents. <laughs> After all, he said, I'm not a Johnny come lately. I'm one of the boys. I'm a Yankee doodle boy and uptown boy. Highly educated. NYU also Holy Cross. He says, kick in with it, 35, boy. Kick in there, boy. Bartender said, I'm very sorry. We charge a dollar for all drinks here. Peter said, for what reason? For what reason specified? <laughs> the bartender said, you see that oil painting on the right? That's a Rembrandt worth $40,000. The one on the left is an old Gainsborough worth $60,000. The one in the middle is invaluable. Well, Peter said, I didn't know you had these kind of facilities. See you again. Comes in the next night, he says, I have funky. Says, I'll have a cocktail. The bartender handed him a cocktail. He put 65 cents on the bar, put his hands over his eyes, and he says, I saw the pictures last night. <laughs> In speaking of the future and the rich legacy which war research and production will leave to the peacetime world, Philco is aware that without victory, there can be no peace and no future for free men. So the only thing that the men and women of Philco are thinking of today in their laboratories, at their desks and machines, is the only thing that matters for us all. Winning the war. At Philco, engineers, scientists, and workers are devoting all their skill, their genius, and the great mass production facilities to the weapons of war, producing radios and vital electronic equipment for planes and tanks, artillery fuses and shells, storage batteries for vital military transport and war industry. But all this research and production for war creates new knowledge, new ideas, new skills. Men of science see their dreams spring to reality. No matter how much the products of their brains and labor may be destroyed in battle, their ideas live. And they will survive after victory to bring you newer and finer products under the famous Philco name in radio, television, refrigeration, and air conditioning. Presenting for the Hall of Fame's finest Laurel Chapeau, Miss Helen Forrest. After serving an apprenticeship as a band vocalist with Artie Shaw, Benny Goodman, and Harry James, Helen stepped out on her own recently with an engagement at the Los Angeles Orpheum. The local variety correspondent caught her act, reported in rave terms to headquarters, and so Helen is with us today. She sings one of her biggest recording successes of 1943, I Don't Want to Walk Without You. Here's Helen Forrest. I thought 
for today you left me behind I take a stroll and get you right off my mind but now As the year draws toward its close in the sound and fury of global war, it is natural that our thoughts should turn toward the future. And if our thoughts on this last Sunday of the old year could be uttered in one huge national voice, it's certain, I think, that they would find expression in a prayer for victory and peace. To give words today to the unspoken New Year meditations of millions and millions of Americans, we had selected a distinguished actor and a great poet. The poet, Stephen Vincent Benet, whose death in 1943 deprived the free world of one of its most eloquent pleaders for human rights. The actor was to have been Orson Welles. When we learned that illness would prevent Mr. Welles from appearing, we were fortunate enough to be able to engage in his place a brilliant young actor, Raymond Edward Johnson, recently starred on Broadway in Sidney Kingsley's prize-winning play, The Patriots. In The Patriots, Mr. Johnson played the role of Thomas Jefferson. Tonight, he speaks as Jefferson might speak to Americans about to enter a third year of war. Raymond Edward Johnson, then, in Toward the Future, a combination of two celebrated radio works by Stephen Vincent Benet. <laughs> our hearts and lives today to the cause of all free mankind. Grant us victory over the tyrants who would enslave all free men and nations. Grant us faith and understanding to cherish all those who fight for freedom as if they were our brothers. Grant us brotherhood and hope and union, not only for the space of this bitter war, but for the days to come, which shall and must unite all the children of earth. Our earth is but a small star in the great universe, yet of it we can make, if we choose, a planet unvexed by war, untroubled by hunger or fear, undivided by senseless distinctions of race, color, or theory. Grant us that courage and foreseeing to begin this task today, that our children and our children's children may be proud of the name of a man. The spirit of man has awakened, and the soul of man has gone forth. Grant us the wisdom and the vision to comprehend the greatness of man's spirit 
that suffers and endures so hugely for a goal beyond his own brief span. Count us honor for our dead who died in the faith. Honor for our living who work and strive for the faith. Redemption and security for all captive lands and peoples. Yet most of all, grant us brotherhood. Not only for this day, but for all our years. A brotherhood not of words, but of acts and deeds. We are all of us. Children of earth. Grant us that simple knowledge. If our brothers are oppressed and we are oppressed, if they hunger, we hunger. If their freedom is taken away, our freedom is not secure. Grant us a common faith that man shall know bread and peace, that we shall know justice and righteousness, freedom and security, an equal opportunity and an equal chance to do his best. Not only in our own land, but throughout the world. And in that faith, let us march toward the clean world our hands can make. This I ask in the name of all Americans everywhere. By what right? By what right do you speak? Who are you? Yeah, who are you, mister? Sounds to me like a fool. An impractical dreamer, that's what he is. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe he's a poet. (laughs) Impractical dreamer, I always say. Impractical dreamer. Listen, mister, what's your name? I have been known by many names in many times and places. I crawled out of the sea in the mud long ages ago. And the gods of the thunder and lightning looked at me and said, That's a queer new fish. You'll never last on land. I hid in the forest, small and frightened. And the dinosaurs clanked around and said, Who's that impractical dreamer? We'll eat him alive. He's got nothing but hands and a brain. But they left their bones in the rock. And I lasted them out and went on. I crept out of caves toward the sunlight. And I built the free cities of Greece and the law that was Rome. I gathered the wisdom of China. And I sent a word crying through Palestine... A word that cries through the centuries to all men and nations. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free, but we are all brothers. And that word goes on. I have dreamed many times. I found a new world in small ships. And none but the believers believed in me when I first dared that unknown West. When I wrote, all men are created free and equal, few believed at first, but slowly many believed and many followed. Jefferson. I shivered and prayed at Valley Forge, and my prayer was answered. When I stood at Gettysburg and spoke over the graves, few believed. But the Union lives and shall live. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Yes, I've been called many names. I've spilt my blood in the streets of Paris and Athens and Moscow. I have grown as an oak tree grows from the roots of English law. I have been a preacher named Paul and a rail splitter named Abe Lincoln. I've been called madman and fool, but it's the brave and the sane who follow me first and always. Always first, there has been the dream and the men who are willing to die for it. I call forth the dream and the men. I call them forth from all nations. When man stands up on his feet and looks his fate in the eyes, 
Only yesterday on Corregidor, my name was Bill Smith from Ohio. And Jesus Maria Garcia was my brother's name. We had a rock to defend, and we defended it. And the name of that rock is Liberty. And in that name I speak. For liberty can be lost by the practical man whose hearts are too shrunken to contain it. Liberty can be bartered away by the greedy minds who cannot see beyond their own day. Liberty can be stolen away by the robber and the brute. But liberty grows like grass in the hearts of the common people. From the blood of their martyrs. And the tyrants rage and are gone, but the dream and the deed endure. And I endure. It is I who command men and win battles. I have called them forth in the past, and I'm calling them forth today. I call the brave to the battle line. I call the sane to the council. I call the free millions of earth to the century ahead. The century of the common man established by you, the people. For this world cannot endure half slave and half free. My name is Freedom. And my command today is unite. Unite in brotherhood for a people's victory. Unite. Unite in brotherhood for a people's peace. Entering up the second act curtain, Paul Whiteman provides a Paul-esque, or should it be Pauline, uh, version of two melodies from the score of the Desert Song, recommended by Variety as the musical movie of the moment. The story is new, but the music has the same Romberg flair of old, as witness Paul's Desert Song medley. <laughs>
of the season. What feelings do they convey for this holiday week of 1943? Against a background of war at a time when so many hearts are filled with anxiety, what is the meaning of this gesture of goodwill among men? Today we offer for each other the greetings of the season as an expression of our faith, courage, and hope. It is a pledge of unity among free men. It is a symbol of our determination to work and to sacrifice that the ideals of peace on earth and goodwill toward men may not perish from the earth. In this spirit, the men and women of Philco Corporation, who are helping to fight the battle of production, look with confidence to the future and to the dawn of a brighter day for all mankind. And for themselves, as well as for Philco dealers everywhere, they send to their many friends in the far corners of the United States and Canada the greetings of the season. Because of his shining career as a heroic tenor in the Wagnerian tradition, because of his lavishly given services in the war tasks of show business, and especially because he adds six feet four inches and 300 pounds of natural gaiety to the New York scene, Variety nominates for the Hall of Fame Lauritz Melchior. Large Lauritz and that small and lovely wife of his, the Kleinchen Maria, are taken together a constant indication that the world of good music is not of necessity a pompous, stuffed shirt, secret society. Consequently, they're beloved of all local men of goodwill. Lauritz, the Great Dane, sings for us a Scandinavian folk song arranged by Edvard Grieg, entitled The Great White Band. Mr. Melchior.
all of which has led us by, we hope, agreeable stages to Fred Allen. And Fred is accompanied by Portland Hoffa, together with the remarkable denizens of Allen's Alley, formerly known as the Mighty Allen Art Players. In the solemnly stated opinion of the editors of Variety, Fred Allen's recent return to the air is just about the most important news of the month in radio, period. If you missed Fred's opening show, you have our sympathy. And to make up for your loss, a condensed version now coming up. To appropriate music, enter Fred Allen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And Deems, I want to thank you for a nice, dull welcome. You should have honed my welcome, stropped it a little before I get out. I would, I would have expected something better from the Milton Burl of Carnegie Hall, Deems, after all. <laughs> Do you realize that I have been away from, <laughs> been away from, away from radio for quite some time? Well, yes. I, well, where have you been? Well, I could say I've been hiding, waiting for a pistol pack and mama to blow over. But I haven't. I've been out in Hollywood, uh, Deems. Well, now, Fred, it didn't take you six months to get back from Hollywood, did it? Have you tried to get a reservation on a train lately? Yes, but even so, California's only 3,000 miles as the crow flies. You can't even get a reservation on a crow, Deems. <laughs> but why should it be so hard to get tickets on trains to California? Housing conditions. I'll explain to you. A man is going from New York to California. He gives up his apartment in New York. He gets on a train. When he arrives at Los Angeles, the city is crowded, you see. He can't find an apartment. He can't get a room in a hotel. He gets back on the train and returns to New York. Well, by now, the apartment he did have here has been rented. He can't find a place to live in New York. He gets on the train. And that's why it's impossible to buy a railroad ticket to California today. Deems thousands of people are living on trains. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. A commuter. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, it must, it, it must be homey. It is homey, Deems. I came back from California on the cheap. One little old lady named Levy had been living in an upper berth with her two daughters and a rubber plant for six months, going and coming from Albuquerque. Uh, wasn't that a bit crowded? Well, it was crowded at first. But one of the daughters married a man named Schwartz, who was living in the lower berth under them, and the two families pooled their space, and now they're all very happy living in a section, Deems. And that's the way it goes. Mr. People are just. Alice. Well, Portland, even here. You're just in time, Portland. Deems and I are discussing, in sort of a stilted way, the housing shortage. It's <laughs> terrible. Some people didn't get any Christmas presents this year. On account of the housing shortage? Yes. A lot of families are living in chimneys. Well, that probably accounts for the flu epidemic, I would say. <laughs> Things are... <laughs> Things, it shows what people will stoop to for money, doesn't it? But things are sure congested. Mama put a nickel in a sandwich slot at the automat last night. Yes. The door flew open. And? A midget was sleeping in there. <laughs> On white or rye bread. <laughs> yes, that shows it's hard to find a place to sleep, Portland. Even midgets are taking slot luck these days. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Something may come of that. Something... My Uncle Phil is sleeping in Central Park. Is that, well, isn't he cold these nights? No, he picked up an old Indian blanket. Well, is your Uncle Phil comfortable under the old Indian blanket? It's a little crowded. The old Indian is still in there. The old Indian, huh? That fixes that up. The old Indian. A new tribe has been developed. The old Indian. You know, I beg your pardon, Fred. I hate to interrupt, but there's a friend of mine in the wings who's very anxious to meet you. Friend in the wings? Some angel in disguise? Well, bring him in, a friend in the wings. Bring him in, Deems. Any friend of yours, I'm sure, is a stranger to me. <laughs> who... <laughs> His name is... Who, who is this party? Uh, Lawrence Melchior. Uh-huh. Uh, come on out, Lawrence. <laughs> Gad, Mr. Melchior, this is a pleasure. You know, I always enjoy meeting people who are still in my former profession. Fred, don't tell me you were singing. 
singer? Why, I was the common Lombardo of my time, Mr. Melchior. Uh, where did you sing? Well, I sang my first solo in a church choir. What happened? Two hundred people changed their religion. <laughs> After a short talk with the minister, I gave up choir work and went into opera. For two solid seasons, we played the Barber of Seville. Then, bang, Lawrence, the electric razor came in and the Barber of Seville was through. <laughs> but enough about little old E-flat me, Mr. Melchior. What about you? You have been in opera many years, I know. Yes, when I first went into opera, Madame Butterfly was only a caterpillar. <laughs> you must have known Boris before he was good enough. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. I'm not here to tell jokes. I came to talk to you. To talk to me? Well, of course, Mr. Melchior. What's on your mind? Right, I have a problem. You, Lawrence Melchior, the Metropolitan's greatest tenor, you have a problem? Yes. I want to quit opera and go into radio. Oh, Lawrence, you're kidding. What's wrong with opera? Long hair and short dough. <laughs> Long hair and short dough. Uh... Yeah, in, in radio they pay singers big money. What singers? Yesterday I read in that some young boy in the radio is making thirty thousand dollars a week. Thirty thousand a week? Thirty thousand dollars a week. And what does he sing? Won't you tell me when? <laughs> <laughs> Now, look, look. <laughs> look, Mr. Melchior. Oh, Fred, make me another Sinatra. You, the great Melchior, want a croon? Yes. Oh, the maestro is jesting. <laughs> the maestro is hungry. <laughs> But, Mr. Melchior, your opera audience is top hat, white tie, and tails. You want to sing for sweatshirts and bobby socks? Thirty thousand dollars for... <laughs> now, look, please, Mr. Melchior, think of those phonograph records you make, those beautiful big 12-inch records. You want to give those up to be on the other side of Spike Jones and his city slickers? Think, Mr. Melchior... Thirty thousand dollars, and all these things is for you. No, well, look, no, please. We but who will take your place starring at the Metropolitan? Jessel is in Hollywood. <laughs> take a baritone's advice, Mr. Melchior. You stick to opera. Oh, I'll try that Sinatra of the hit parade. But you're not the Sinatra type. You've got to be thin. I think I'm too robust. Robust? Why, your tonsils weigh more than Sinatra. <laughs> Why, when he's on the air, you can't tell whether Sinatra is singing into the microphone or the microphone is giving Sinatra a transfusion. <laughs> forget the forget the whole thing. Oh, please, Fred. Get me on the radio. But you can't compare radio to opera. Opening night at the Met. Think, the curtain rises. Your glorious voice casts a magic spell over the audience. Men and women throw their hats and mink into the air and cheer. Bravo, Melchior! Beast, Melchior! Bravo, bravo, beast, beast! Ah, uh, yes, that's true. But thirty thousand oh, dollars. Won't you tell me when? <laughs> Lawrence, look, I think I can make you see the folly of your way. Will you do me a favor? Yes. Uh, sing me an aria. I just want to prove something to you. You sing me one of those adenoid rattlers of yours. <laughs> Would you sing a song for me? Yes, I will. All right. Uh, what about this one here? The boy in her mantle of whiteness has shining eyes all the time, while roses reflecting the brightness and all that they do.
what I mean. That's your racket. You see, that's what you like to do. That's what you do best. You should stick to that type of music. I know, I know. But uh, his house is our Won't you tell me where we will meet again? All right. All right. You want to get into radio? I'll show you, Mr. Melchior. If the wrong... <laughs> Uh, if the wrong sponsor signs you, you're apt to end up on a radio show that sounds something like this. We're on the air. The makers of Pasternak Pretzels present Light Candy Melchior. Light Candy Melchior is brought to you every hour on the hour every day, 168 times a week by the makers of Pasternak Personality Pretzels. Today, while every other pretzel is made by machine, untouched by human hands, only Pasternak pretzels are made by hand. Pasternak himself takes a handful of wet dough and steps into a red-hot oven. A few twists, a few turns. When Pasternak is lifted out of that red-hot oven... In his hand, he holds a pretzel. No deceit, no trickery, no other pretzel can make this claim. With men who know pretzels best, it's Pasternak, seven and three-eighths to two. And now, life can be Melchior. Life can be Melchior. The story of one man's struggle to be a failure. <laughs> Little Larry Melchior was born in a motel in Ohio. Today on that very site, there stands a Burma shave sign. The world knew that a great singer had been born when the tiny baby's first words were, Figaro, 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 Figaro. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. At school, his genius was immediately recognized. The teacher gave little Larry a pitch pipe, a metronome, and a picture of Rudy Valley to inspire him. After graduation, he forged ahead with his music. Day after day, hour after hour, little Larry Melchior practiced. Piggle, 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 piggle. Four years at Curtis Institute of Music, Melchior sang. Piggle, 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 piggle. Eight years at the Juilliard School of Music, Melchior carried on. Piggle, 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 piggle. And then came the crucial test. His audition for the Metropolitan Opera Company, Melchior sang, <laughs> he had forgotten the word. <laughs> but this did not stop Lawrence Melchior. Oh, no. Back to ten more years of... <laughs> and then Lawrence Melchior finally reached his goal. He became a star at the Metropolitan. His golden voice sang... And now he was ready for his crowning achievement, starring on his own radio program. And here is the star of the Pasternak Pretzel Program, Laurette Melchior, bringing you the music he has spent a lifetime to achieve. Maestro, please. The best Pasternak dance is laboratory test. All gone none is faulty. Pasternak friends are so salty. Pasternak friends are salty.
Next week on the Radio Hall of Fame, Burns and Allen, Raymond Graham Swing, Georgia Gibbs, and another group of star personalities recommended by Variety for your pleasure. We'd expect you at the gates of the hall this time next week, this station. Find Dean Taylor. The production and writing staff of the Radio Hall of Fame includes D. Engelbach, George Faulkner, and Abel Green, editor of Variety. Fred Allen was presented by arrangement with his sponsor, Texaco. This is Glenn Riggs wishing you a happy new year from Philco dealers and distributors throughout the United States and Canada. And from the Philco Corporation, makers today of radio, communications, and electronic materials to help win the war. Makers tomorrow of materials for good living in a world at peace. the Blue Network. Thomas Jefferson, First Inaugural Address, in Washington, D.C., Wednesday, March 4th, 1801. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Friends and fellow citizens, called upon to undertake the duties of the first executive office of our country, I avail myself of the presence of that portion of my fellow citizens which is here assembled to express my grateful thanks for the favor with which they have been pleased to look towards me, to declare a sincere consciousness that the task is above my talents, and that I approach it with those anxious and awful presentments which the greatness of the charge and the weakness of my powers so justly inspire. A rising nation, spread over a wide and fruitful land, traversing all the seas with the rich productions of their industry, engaged in commerce with nations who feel power and forget right, advancing rapidly to destinies beyond the reach of mortal eye. When I contemplate these transcendent objects and see the honor the happiness and the hopes of this beloved country committed to the issue and the auspices of this day, I shrink from the contemplation and humble myself before the magnitude of the undertaking. Utterly, indeed, should I despair did not the presence of many whom I here see remind me that in the other high authorities provided by our Constitution I shall find resources of wisdom, of virtue, and of zeal on which to rely under all difficulties. To you, then, gentlemen, who are charged with the sovereign functions of legislation, and to those associated with you, I look with encouragement for that guidance and support which may enable us to steer with safety the vessel in which we are all embarked amidst the conflicting elements of a troubled world. During the contest of opinion through which we have passed, the animation of discussions and of exertions has sometimes worn an aspect which might impose on strangers unused to think freely and to speak and to write what they think. But this being now decided by the voice of the nation, announced according to the rules of the Constitution, all will, of course, arrange themselves under the will of the law and unite in common efforts for the common good. All, too, will bear in mind the sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable, that the minority possess their equal rights, which equal law must protect, and to violate would be oppression. Let us then, fellow citizens, unite with one heart and one mind. Let us restore to social intercourse that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. And let us reflect that, having banished from our land that religious intolerance under which mankind so long bled and suffered, we have yet gained little if we countenance a political intolerance as despotic, as wicked, and capable of as bitter and bloody persecutions. 
During the throes and convulsions of the ancient world, during the antagonizing spasms of infuriated man, seeking through blood and slaughter his long-lost liberty, it was not wonderful that the agitation of the billow should reach even this distant and peaceful shore, that this should be more felt and feared by some and less than others, and should divide opinions as to measures of safety. But every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. If there be any among us who would wish to dissolve this Union or to change its Republican form, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. I know, indeed, that some honest men fear that a Republican government cannot be strong, that this government is not strong enough. But would the honest patriot, in the full tide of successful experiment, abandon a government which has so far kept us free and firm on the theoretic and visionary fear that this government, the world's best hope, may by possibility want energy to preserve itself? I trust not. I believe this, on the contrary the strongest government on earth. I believe it the only one where every man at the call of law would fly to the standard of the law and would meet invasions of the public order as his own personal concern. Sometimes it is said that a man cannot be trusted with the government of himself. Can he then be trusted with the government of others? Or have we found angels in the form of kings to govern him? Let history answer this question. Let us then, with courage and confidence, pursue our own federal and republican principles, our attachment to union and representative government. Kindly separated by nature and a wide ocean from the exterminating havoc of one quarter of the globe, too high-minded to endure the degradations of the others, Possessing a chosen country, with room enough for our descendants to the thousandth and thousandth generation, entertaining a due sense of our equal right to the use of our own faculties, to the acquisitions of our own industry, to honor and confidence from our fellow citizens, resulting not from birth, but from our actions and their sense of them, enlightened by a benign religion, professed indeed and practiced in various forms, yet all of them inculcating honesty, truth, temperance, gratitude, and the love of man. Acknowledging and adoring an overruling providence, which by all its dispensations proves that it delights in the happiness of man here and his greater happiness thereafter. With all these blessings, what more is necessary to make us a happy and prosperous people? Still one more thing, fellow citizens. A wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government, and this is necessary to close the circle of our felicities. About to enter, fellow citizens, on the exercise of duties which comprehend everything dear and valuable to you, it is proper you should understand what I deem the essential principles of our government, and consequently those which ought to shape its administration. I will compress them within the narrowest compass they will bear, stating the general principle, but not all its limitations. Equal and exact justice to all men, of whatever state or persuasion, religious or political. Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. The support of the state governments and all their rights as the most competent administrations for our domestic concerns and the surest bulwarks against anti-republican tendencies. The preservation of the general government in its whole constitutional vigor as the sheet anchor of our peace at home and safety abroad. A jealous care of the right of election by the people a mild and safe corrective of abuses which are locked by the sword of revolution where peaceable remedies are unprovided, absolute acquiescence in the decisions of the majority, the vital principle of republics, from which, 
is no appeal but to force, the vital principle and immediate parent of despotism, a well-disciplined militia, our best reliance in peace and for the first moments of war, till regulars may relieve them, the supremacy of the civil over the military authority, economic and the public expense, that labor may be lightly burdened, the honest payment of our debts and sacred preservation of the public faith, encouragement of agriculture and of commerce as its handmaid, the diffusion of information and arraignment of all abuses at the bar of public reason, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and freedom of person under protection of habeas corpus, and trial by juries impartially selected. These principles form the bright constellation which has gone before us and guided our steps through an age of revolution and reformation. The wisdom of our sages and blood of our heroes have been devoted to their attainment. They should be the creed of our political faith, the text of civic instruction, the touchstone by which to try the services of those who we trust. And should we wander from them in moments of error or of alarm, let us hasten to retrace our steps and to regain the road which alone leads to peace, liberty, and safety. I repair then, fellow citizens, to the post you have assigned me. With experience enough in subordinate offices to have seen the difficulties of this greatest of all, I have learnt to expect that it will rarely fall to the lot of imperfect man to retire from this station with the reputation and the favor which bring him into it. Without pretensions to that high confidence you reposed in our first and greatest revolutionary character, whose preeminent services has entitled him to the first place in his country's love and destined for him the fairest page in the volume of faithful history, I ask so much confidence only as may give firmness and effect to the legal administration of your affairs. I shall often go wrong through defect of judgment. When right, I shall often be thought wrong by those whose positions will not command a view of the whole ground. I ask your indulgence for my own errors, which will never be intentional, and your support against the errors of others who may condemn what they would not have seen in all of its parts. The approbation implied by your suffrage is a great consolation to me for the past, and my future solicitude will be to retain the good opinion of those who have bestowed it in advance, to conciliate that of others by doing them all the good in my power, and to be instrumental to the happiness and freedom of all. Relying then on the patronage of your good will, I advance with obedience to the work, ready to retire from it whenever you become sensible how much better choice it is in your power to make. And may that infinite power, which rules the destinies of the universe, lead our counsels to what is best, and give them a favorable issue for your peace and prosperity. End Thomas Jefferson First Inaugural Address Read by M. L. Cohen MojoMoo411.com, Cleveland, Ohio, September 2007. This is ChestertonRadio.com. <laughs> This is John Daly at Convention Hall, Richmond, Virginia. On this 25th day of June, 1788, the Virginia Ratifying Convention has been taken completely by surprise. Mr. Edmund Randolph, present governor of Virginia, has come out publicly in favor of the proposed federal constitution for the United States of America. As a delegate to this crucial convention, and up to now an avowed enemy of the constitution, Governor Randolph has been a leader in the campaign against ratification. But he has just told reporters that he will speak and vote for ratification when the convention reconvenes to vote a few minutes from now. Thus, the Constitution, which would unite the 13 American states under a strong central government, has found a powerful friend in an unexpected quarter. June 25th, 1788, the Convention Hall, Richmond, Virginia. You are there. Virginia. 
key state in the plan to form the 13 original states into a united America stands undecided, torn by dissension, and the Constitution hangs in the balance. CBS takes you back 160 years to the day that determined whether Americans could go forward from revolution and establish a stable central government. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there. You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical facts and quotations. And now, Virginia, the Richmond Convention Hall, and John Daly. For a group of reporters hurriedly summoned to the governor's executive chamber a few minutes ago, asked why he is turning from the party of Patrick Henry to the party of James Madison, Governor Randolph would not amplify his statements, saying only that he will give the reasons which prompted his move on the floor of the convention. And we hurried from that news conference to this microphone here on the convention floor to bring you this news. There's Mr. James Monroe, one of Mr. Patrick Henry's chief lieutenants, in the fight against ratification. Mr. Monroe. Sir. Sir, are you aware that Governor Randolph has gone over to the Federalist Party? I am indeed. Uh, Would you care to comment on it, Mr. Monroe? Any remarks on Governor Randolph's strange conduct will come from Mr. Henry, the leader of our party. But how do you think Governor Randolph's action will uh, affect the vote on ratification, sir? No comment, sir. No comment. Mr. Monroe has turned away from the microphone. Our brief conversation, a mark of the confusion Governor Randolph's change of mind has produced here. Ned Calmer has been analyzing the possibilities inherent in Governor Randolph's action and is ready now with his report. So over to our CBS headquarters booth here in Convention Hall and Ned Calmer. Governor Randolph's sudden allegiance to the Federalists may have a decisive effect on this convention. Roughly half of the delegates represent the cities, towns, and the Tidewater planters, and the other half come from the rural districts. Generally speaking, the planters and the businessmen are in favor of a national constitution. They are haunted by memories of Daniel Shea's rebellion in Massachusetts last year, and they want the constitution as an instrument to end social chaos. On the other hand, the rural delegates, by and large, oppose the constitution. At present, they're paying their debts with cheap state paper money, and they fear that national currency reforms would work to their disadvantage. But Governor Randolph has much influence and prestige among the country delegates. His change of position may very well swing the necessary votes from among them to carry the ratification. Thus, what happens here in Virginia today may decide the destiny of America. As you know, nine states must ratify the proposed Constitution if it's to supplant the Articles of Confederation. Eight states have already ratified, and four others probably will not. If Virginia fails to ratify, the Constitution is likely to be doomed. And in that case, just a moment, Governor Randolph, at his executive mansion, has consented to grant our reporter, Don Hollenbeck, a brief interview before departing for this convention hall. So over to Don Hollenbeck at the governor's mansion. Governor Randolph, sir, will you tell us why you've made this last-minute turn from the anti-Constitution party to the Federalists? I have joined the Federalists because the anti-Constitution party has caused too much, far too much delay on the pressing issue of a strong central government. Why do you feel that we need a strong central government such as the proposed Constitution outlines? It is imperative. The union of the state sags apart for want of it. Mr. Henry fails to see the danger. He occupies himself with legalistic assaults on various phases of the Constitution without realizing that the measure as a whole is desperately needed. Well, Governor, do you endorse the proposed Constitution in toto without amendments? No, I do not. I hope and trust that certain amendments will subsequently be adopted, such as um, a Bill of Rights and um, a clause absolutely forbidding the importation of Negro slaves. But all that can come later. Time is running out, and we cannot go on under the Articles of Confederation. Thank you, Governor Randolph. This is Don Hollenbeck returning you now to John Daly on the floor of Convention Hall. About 80 delegates are here now, and among them is Mr. Patrick Henry, former governor of Virginia, leader of the anti-Constitution party. He's wearing the ill-fitting wig and chevy black coat for which he is famous, and his hawk-like face is grim and forbidding. Mr. Henry! Sir, would you care to comment on Governor Randolph's repudiation of the anti-Constitution party? Governor Randolph, bah! My opponents are welcome to him. He, like they, has turned his back on the revolution. He's divorced himself from the common people and embrace that hydra-headed monster property. Well, do you mean to suggest, sir, that the Constitution favors the property-holding classes of the nation? Yes. May I charge you? The worship of private property is implicit in every article of that infamous document. 
one year ago, sir, at Philadelphia, the Constitution stank so noisomely that Governor Randolph refused to sign it. Does it smell any sweeter now? No. The Constitution remains unchanged. It is Edmund Randolph who has changed. Randolph. An empty sail billowing with the wind from the tidewater. Are you implying, Mr. Henry, that Governor Randolph has yielded to pressure from the tidewater plantation? No, no. Randolph was born with a golden spoon in his mouth. He's rich. He has many slaves. He is also a politician, and as such, he flirted briefly with the ideas of liberty and equality. (laughs) But the governor has seen the light. Property is the thing that counts. Well, wouldn't you say, sir, that the protection of private property is important for the welfare of the country? Important, yes. But human rights are equally important. And where, I ask you, where do you find one single mention of human rights in this Constitution that we are asked to ratify today? But if that is so, Mr. Henry, how do you explain that eight states have already ratified the Constitution? Citizens of those eight states would bargain away their heritage of freedom for a mess of pot. For my part, give me liberty greatest of all earthly blessings. Give me that precious jewel, and you may take everything else. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Here comes Mr. Madison. He's a small man and quiet of voice, but Mr. Madison yields to no man in intellectual capacity. Indeed, he is as famous for the logic of his arguments as Mr. Patrick Henry is for the brilliance of his oratory. Mr. Madison! Mr. Madison, Mr. Henry has just charged that the Constitution places property rights above human rights. An interesting phrase. But then Patrick Henry is a master of interesting phrases. One of them helped to start our revolution. The trouble is, Mr. Henry is in a constant state of revolution. He should remember that the war is over and that his antagonists in this hall are not redcoats. Yes, Mr. Madison, but uh, what about his argument, sir? Ah, yes. uh, Property rights above human rights. Well, now, suppose we examine that without the benefit of oratory, shall we? Mr. Henry would give you the impression that this is a struggle between the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak. The fact is, sir, that there are wealthy men who hate the Constitution and poor men who love it. The point is that all Americans, rich and poor, are in dire straits today because we have no strong central government. Mr. Henry poses as the shining knight of liberty. But where, sir, is liberty without order? Order is what we need, not at the expense of human rights but precisely to render them secure. Well, Mr. Madison, it's been reported that Mr. Thomas Jefferson, our ambassador to France, is against the Constitution. That, sir, is a distortion. Mr. Jefferson is a friend of mine. I'm in constant correspondence with him. It is true that he disagrees with some aspects of the Constitution, but on the whole, he favors it. As a matter of fact, it would be well for Mr. Henry to remember there are other patriots of the War for Independence who stand behind the Constitution. Not only Thomas Jefferson... But General Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Dickinson, and a host of others. Thank you, Mr. Madison. A pleasure, sir. Well, you've heard that the Constitution would be of great benefit to all Americans, and you've also heard that it will benefit only the rich. Outside this Virginia hall, there's a representative crowd waiting for the result of the vote, and Ken Roberts is out there. So let's switch to him and find out how these people feel about the Constitution. Go ahead, Ken Roberts. In this crowd, judging by their dress, are people from every section and class of Virginia. I see men who are obviously planters, others who must be tradesmen, and a large number of farming folk. Some of them must have come a long way to be in Richmond at this fateful hour. Here, for instance, is a tall man wearing a fringed shirt and a coonskin cap. Where are you from, sir? I be from Painville, in the western district. You're a delegate, sir? Nay. I come here to watch all the delegates. Oh? I want to be sure they vote the way they're supposed to. And uh, how are the delegates in the Western District supposed to vote, Mr. Uh, uh, Holloway, Thomas Holloway, and they're still supposed to vote against the Constitution when Governor Randolph will be paying for turning his court on us come next election. Uh, would you mind telling us why you're against the Constitution, Mr. Holloway? See this bullet wound in my left arm? I received it ten years ago from September. I received it fighting to free Virginia from the rule of King George. Don't you mean that you were fighting to free the United States? Nay, to free Virginia. But aren't you a citizen of the United States? Nay, I'm a citizen of Virginia. We fought to be rid of the third George, and we want no force to take his place. 
But you think the Constitution would result in a king being imposed on the American state? I. What makes you think so? If there be a Constitution, there'll be a president. If there be a president, he'll waste no time making himself into a monarch. But, uh, Mr. Holloway, it's generally agreed that if the Constitution is ratified, the first president of the United States will be General George Washington. Aye. Right. He'll waste no time making himself into a monarch. Ridiculous. You think that General Washington, if elected, will establish a monarchy? Aye. Right. There'll be nothing in the Constitution to stop him if he's a mind to. And I reckon he'll have a mind to. Power would be spoiling a man, say I. There's oh, always no, that's that. That's a ridiculous thing. Oh, Mr. 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 Holloway has just been interrupted by a well-dressed man in the crowd. Would you have a mind to be crying at the time? Would you have a mind to be crying at the time? Gentlemen, gentlemen, just a moment. Sir, we'll be glad to have your opinions on General Washington and the Constitution after Mr. Holloway is finished. Speak for himself. I have no personal opinion. Now, Mr. Holloway, you were just saying General Washington will make himself king if the Constitution is ratified. Aye, and he could do it. According to the Constitution, the president would have his own standing army. Yes, but wouldn't the army be subject to the decisions of the federal Congress? With a gun at its throat, what could the Congress do? He'll be making himself monarch, Congress or no. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Now, sir, now you have your opportunity. You tell you, now, he's an empty head, that. Empty head, I would tell you, see, abuse, canard, uh, that's the way with you rascals. The rascals you impute the most deadly to the pitches to bring the Constitution. You, you, you don't want the truth. The one that you're a right, troublemaker, that's all you are. Just come in the back one. Be holding your tongue now, you're fighting that empty head. Don't please, please, gentlemen, we were discussing something else. Let's get back to the Constitution. Yes, the Constitution. I predict, sir, that unless the Constitution is ratified... The merchants of this country will be ruined, yeah. wiped out utterly. Are you a merchant, sir? Yes, sir, I am. I wouldn't uh, call them that. I am a merchant, sir. I trade in tobacco, uh, fine Virginia leaf, sir. Ask anyone in Richmond, you'll find that Ralph Barker handles only the best. And you feel that the Constitution, yes. if ratified, would be a boon to business? Absolutely, sir. Business is bad today, all oh, bad, very bad. Oh, and my warehouse is bursting with unsold tobacco. The, the, the country is in a depression. And it's because of the money situation. Scandalous. Absolutely. Would you explain that, please, Mr. Uh, Barker? Yes, oh. you explain. I will, if you would only give me a chance. My, my word, there, there are so many different kinds of money in circulation. It's like the man in The blooms, the stones, gold, Johannes' English, French crowns, English guineas, Spanish dollars. But, yes, and to cap it all, the states are issuing money that isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Now, now, how on earth can a merchant do business under such conditions? I it must be difficult. Necessary. Difficult? Why, it's impossible. It, it, it's confusion compounded into an unholy mess. And you feel that the Constitution, if ratified, would restore order in interstate commerce and regulate the currency? Yes, sir, I do. Of course I do. The Constitution specifically... This is John Daly in Convention Hall. We have interrupted Ken Roberts because Governor Randolph has just come in. He entered by a side door to avoid the crowd outside. Now he is walking down the aisle, and the tension here is so thick one can literally feel it. Uh, Mr. Henry has just snubbed Governor Randolph, and the snub was unmistakable. His face pale, the governor has walked to his seat, sits down, shakes hands with Mr. Madison. Now the gavel sounds. Mr. Pendleton, president of the convention is calling the delegates to order. The final debate will begin in a few moments. As you know, the resolution embodying the Constitution has already been debated clause by clause in the three weeks this convention has been in session. And now, Mr. Pendleton. ...ratifying convention is hereby declared to be officially convened. By previous agreement, the final speech in opposition to ratification will be made by Mr. Patrick Henry. And he will be followed by Mr. James Madison, who will speak in favor of ratification of the proposed federal constitution. I now recognize the first speaker, Mr. Henry. And Patrick Henry rises, walking slowly up the aisle. Uh, He's moving toward the front of the hall. Now he's mounting the rostrum, his hawk-like eyes under that ragged wig look out piercingly around the room, and they have come to rest on Governor Randolph. Uh, Mr. Henry stares at the governor now with an expression of, well, you might almost call it contempt, and now Mr. Mr. Henry is about to speak. My concluding remarks in behalf of the anti-Constitution party, the party of liberty, will be brief. But I would first make a few observations on the conduct of one of the delegates. I am referring to none other than Governor Edmund Randolph. 
Last year in Philadelphia, Governor Randolph denounced the Constitution. It seems to me very strange that that which was then the subject of his denunciation should today become the object of his praise. Something extraordinary must have happened to operate so great a change in his opinion. Mr. President! Mr. President! Governor Randolph is calling for the floor. He's been ruled out of order. Now, Mr. Henry. I yield to the member. Let us hear what the honorable member has to say. The honorable speaker hints that I have changed my opinions for some hidden and therefore discreditable reason. I have no personal intention of offending anyone. I merely do my duty. The gentleman smiles when he says that. His conduct is malicious. And it is not compatible with the least shadow of friendship. Very well. If our friendship was fall, let it fall like Lucifer, never to rise again. Does the member accuse me of malicious behavior? I believe the meaning of my words is clear. Is the member prepared to back up his remarks with D? If the gentleman seeks satisfaction, he will find my second place. I thank the gentleman for his willingness to render satisfaction. Mr. President, I request a short recess in order to arrange the details of a matter of honor. All right. All right. This is unprecedented. <clears throat> However, due to uh, the member's request is granted, I hereby declare a five-minute recess. <laughs> Mr. Randolph and Mr. Henry are leaving the hall, no doubt to choose and confer with their seconds as is traditional in these affairs of honor among gentlemen. This is a startling turn of events, and we'll try and bring you the developments just as fast as we can. The floor here is a scene of confusion. The delegates are milling about shouting and arguing, shaking their fists at each other, and from the look of things here, it would almost seem that there'll be more affairs of honor out there on the floor of this convention hall, unless this convention is called back into order, and very soon, and there's Mr. Pendleton, Mr. Pendleton, sir, uh, will the session resume in spite of this conflict between uh, Mr. Henry and Mr. Randolph? Yes, I will reconvene in five minutes. And the vote will be taken as scheduled, sir? Uh, do you have anything to say on that? No, not now, please. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Pendleton. The debate will continue. The vote will be taken despite this dramatic interruption. As you know, Mr. Henry is one of the principal speakers, and he must be back before the convention can properly be reconvened. As I said before, the floor is a scene of confusion, and there is a chance there will be more of these affairs of honor unless the convention is indeed called back into session and very soon. But now I've seen Ned Kelmer out there circulating quickly among the delegates, to learn how Mr. Henry's attack on Governor Randolph will affect the vote. So let's go over to our CBS headquarters booth and Ned Kalman. Well, on the basis of my brief conversations with the delegates just now, it's safe to say that Mr. Henry, by his open attack on Mr. Randolph, has restored the situation to what it was before the governor came out in favor of the Constitution. Yes, I'd say there's no doubt about that. The delegates from the rural districts admire forceful speech and prompt action. They saw it today, and no matter what outsiders may think of Mr. Henry's conduct, well, his action sits well with the country people. These uh, rural delegates who might have been shaken by Governor Randolph's new allegiance to the Federalists now seem to be back in the anti-Constitution fold definitely, and it does look as if the Constitution may fail of ratification. And we... Now Mr. Pendleton has called the convention to order again, so back to John Daly on the convention floor. The Republic itself. The delegates are again seated. The convention has reconvened and Mr. Henry has resumed the floor and is speaking on the resolution embodying the proposed federal constitution of the United States of America. Now let's listen to Mr. Patrick Henry. ...exclusion of the four remaining states. Congress under this proposed constitution would have a tyrant's power and more. It could lay whatever taxes it chooses. With a standing army, it could keep the people in submission. The president, if he should be ruthless and able would make himself an absolute ruler. I would rather have a king, lord, and a house of commons than a government complete with such insupportable evil. Gentlemen, my opponents ask you to surrender not only the sword and the purse, but the very scales of justice. Ratify this constitution, and you place our state courts at the mercy of federal courts. A monstrous creation. I dread popular resistance to this proposed government. So vague, so indefinite, 
so ambiguous in its assurances of liberty and human rights. Let me warn you in the most emphatic terms of the dreadful effects which must ensue should the people resist. I beg, I beseech the delegates to search their consciences and vote nay, nay on this resolution. Let's say rouse the people to rebellion in defense of their God-given liberties. <laughs> Mr. Henry has left the rostrum, and Mr. Madison is coming up now to speak. He carries his hat in his hand. Now he's taking some slips of paper out of the hat. They are the notes for his address, and he's waiting for the convention to come to order. Order. The chair recognizes Mr. James Madison. Mr. President, fellow delegates, I yield to no man in my respect for the previous speaker. Yet in these brief concluding remarks, I would point out that his objections to the Constitution arise out of misunderstanding. This is not strange because the form of government we are proposing is new, unique in the history of the world. Let the delegates, therefore, not measure it by outmoded standards. Mr. President, the American states have stirred the admiration of the world by setting up free governments under the pressure of war. How much more will they win admiration if they should be able peaceably to establish one central government when not cemented by common danger? But will the states achieve that goal? Suppose only eight states ratify and Virginia refuses to become the ninth except on her own terms. Then even if the others agree to our terms, which is doubtful, every state must call new conventions to consider the amendments. There will be endless disagreements. Every state will be encouraged to offer its own amendment. Agreement will be even more difficult to reach than it was in Philadelphia. In short, Mr. President, if Virginia holds out today, the United States may never have a functioning central government. But if Virginia ratifies the Constitution, it may bring the most fortunate event in the history of mankind. I therefore respectfully submit that the Honorable Delegate vote yea on the resolution before us, the resolution containing the Constitution of the United States of America. Mr. Madison replaces his notes in his hat and leaves the rostrum and from the floor many voices calling the question. Mr. Pendleton is raising his gavel. The convention will now vote on the resolution embodying the proposed Constitution for the United States of America. The vote will be by a show of hands. A simple majority will decide. Those delegates who are in favor, those who wish to vote aye on the proposition, will raise their right hand. Hands are going up all over the hall, and the tellers are moving about counting. A total of 166 votes will be cast. 84 are necessary to carry or defeat the resolution. And it seems now as if half the number of delegates here have their hands up, but it's impossible to tell exactly. However, it's going to be close. You can be sure of that. Very close. We'll know the result in a moment from the eye count. If it's 84 or over, the eyes will have it. And the Constitution will be ratified here in the Virginia Convention and will become the law of the land. The tellers have completed their count now and are moving up to report to the rostrum. They're at the rostrum. Mr. Pendleton is receiving their reports, checking the totals, and we'll know in a moment. Uh, Mr. Pendleton. The tellers report in favor of the resolution, 89 votes. <laughs> United States is now committed to a strong central government.
government. We have a president, a congress, a federal judiciary, a national army under the Constitution. I have a copy here in my hand, and it's preempt to begin. We, the people of the United States, in order to... June 25th, 1788, Virginia ratifies the Constitution and government of, by, and for the people begins. The ratification of the Constitution was another broadcast in the series, You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Sheehan. The program was written by Michael Sklar. Thomas Chalmers played Patrick Henry, Richard Waring was James Madison, Eric Dressler played Governor Randolph, and the cast included Carl Swenson, Chester Stratton, Bernard Lenro, Guy Sorrell, and others. Footnote. The Virginia Convention debated and voted under the impression that it was the ninth necessary ratifying state. The ninth necessary state was actually New Hampshire. It had ratified four days earlier. Mr. Madison, Mr. Henry, and their colleagues did not know this because in those days news traveled slowly. Beginning next week, You Are There will be broadcast regularly over most of these stations at a new time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for You Are There next week and thereafter. Next week, November 7th, 1637, Puritan, New England. The trial of Anne Hutchinson. You are there. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton Day at ChestertonRadio.com. There are people in most countries who would like to live in the Republic of the United States or the Dominion of Canada where that good Olga coal is sold. The citizens of our free countries are the envy of many people elsewhere because of the personal freedom which we have enjoyed. Why, then, doesn't every country adopt a form of free government? One answer is that, unfortunately, there are people and parties in many nations who are so greedy for power that they will sacrifice the freedom of their fellow countrymen to obtain power for themselves. History, even recent history, is replete with such instances. That is why the citizens of the Republic of the United States and the Dominion of Canada must be careful to recognize at its very beginning any movement to steal or limit their freedom. That is not always easy. The man who would enslave a free people doesn't begin by saying, now I'm going to be your dictator. Instead, he probably will claim that he is a devoted supporter of personal freedom. But all the while, he will support policies that weaken and undermine personal freedom. Such a man will deny any totalitarian aims. But free citizens must not be deceived by such denials. Apparently, it is a cardinal principle of every sincere totalitarian that he is justified in lying if such lies will advance his plans. In these times, no public figure and no party or organization supporting such a person can be accepted without careful consideration. Every public figure and organization must be carefully scrutinized, and if their real aims are to limit or to destroy our freedom as individuals, they must be opposed and defeated. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Story Behind the Song.
Toward the close of the Second War with Great Britain, the War of 1812, just following the raid of the British upon the city of Washington, we see a young man hurrying along the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, a look of earnest intent upon his face, determination in every vigorous stride. Francis Key. John Skinner, greetings. What's the reason for this haste? Have you heard of the plight of old Dr. William Beans? Dr. Beans? No, what's happened? He's under arrest on board the British flagship. Good heavens. What for? Well, doubtlessly acting from patriotic motives, he placed a pack of British camp followers under arrest and clapped them in jail for disturbing the peace in Upper Marlboro. He's magistrate there, isn't he? Yes, but that didn't seem to impress the British Navy. I've been assigned the task of trying to save the old doctor from hanging. Hanging? I'm quite sure it's just a threat that we must keep our hands off any British sympathizers henceforth. You're going to the British flagship? I am, right now. But man, isn't that dangerous? Dangerous? <laughs> of course it's dangerous. You can't walk into the hands of the enemy without danger. I'll go with you. What? Yes, I'll go with you. You'll need someone to help you. Well, very well. Thank you, John. Come along. <laughs> Francis Scott Key and John Skinner embark upon a small boat which takes them directly to the British flagship on the morning of September 6th, 1814, and are ushered into the quarters of Vice Admiral Sir George Coburn. Well, well, gentlemen, this is indeed an honor. Thank you, sir. My quarters are small, but ample for my needs until I return to England. Pray be seated. Be seated, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, uh, you are Mr. Francis Scott Key? I am, sir. And of what service can I be to you, sir? We seek the release of an American citizen, one Dr. William Beans, whom your forces took captive some days ago. <laughs> oh, so that's it. It is. <laughs> it is, is it? Well, well, well. I can't say that I'm surprised, gentlemen. Very well. We shall see. Lieutenant? Aye, sir. Bring the prisoner Beans to me here. Aye, sir. He's an irascible old chap, isn't he? I fear he'd make a poor naval man. In what way, sir? Well, he doesn't like the food, nor his bed, nor his guard. <laughs> Indeed, you would have thought the Prime Minister himself were aboard the ship. The manner in which we cater to the old doctor's whims. There, ah, there, the doctor himself. Come in, my good friend. I'm not your good friend. And I demand this outrage cease at once. I demand my release. Oh, now, now, doctor, you must be patient. Patient? Patient? Do you realize, sir, that you are detaining a citizen of the United States of America? I realize, sir, that now I am detaining three citizens of the United States of America. What? Do you mean that you're holding Mr. Skinner and myself as prisoners? Not as prisoners, gentlemen, as in forced guests. Ah, this is an insult. No, no, not an insult, my good doctor. I am paying all of you a most generous and gracious compliment. I do not understand. I shall explain myself, Mr. Key. In a few days, our fleet sails under battle orders for certain maneuvers, which, if known in circles of the American Army or Navy, would doubtless fail. I know, of course, that you gentlemen are patriots of your own country and would not hesitate to reveal any secrets you might have learned while aboard this ship. So, I detain you as guests of the British Navy. And where is the compliment, if you please, sir? Ah, the compliment. Yes, yes. Quite simple, Mr. Key. Instead of allowing you to return to your homes and chancing that you withhold the information... I invite you to remain here, because I know that you are patriots. For a week, the three Americans are held aboard the British ship, until on the night of September 13th, we find them on deck, talking among themselves. I have heard news, Key. What is it, Skinner? Quickly. Yes, man, this suspense. One of the sailors told me the British are attacking Fort McHenry tonight. Fort McHenry? Then that is our destination. I have heard, too, that while the fleet attacks the fort by sea, General Ross will be attacking North Point by land. And Major Armistead with a handful of men at the fort. A small wonder Sir George detained us with such information floating about. Yes, and here we are. Three able-bodied Americans helpless to lend assistance to our country. Uh, I'm going below. I will not stand here to see my country fired upon without being able to lift a finger in defense. 
<laughs> Poor Dr. Beans, still the militant. Oh, the night is black. I wish we could see. All we shall see, John, is the fire from these cannons and the answer from Fort McHenry. Until dawn. Yes, until dawn. Oh, when will it begin? Not impatient, John. No, no. Just uneasy. This waiting. Wait no more, John. It's beginning. Oh, what will they do at Fort McHenry? Probably return the fire. Yes. There. Skinner, can you see anything at the fort? No. You cannot see the flag by any chance, can you? No. Wait. Yes. Yes. Yes, I see it too. What are you doing? Writing. On an old envelope? What are you writing? A little verse. I didn't know you were a poet. No, not a poet, John. Just a writer of verses. Oh, how can you write under these conditions? Let the thought suit the inspiration. What? What do you mean? Wait. I have another line. The rocket's red glare. Oh, yes. The bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Through the night, the two Americans stand watching, watching, watching. Then, toward dawn... Oh, this awful night. It's most over, I think, John. Yes, look. There in the east, a faint glow of light. Where? Oh, yes. I see it. We shall soon know the fate of those poor devils at the fort. Yes, soon. Let us hope they withstood the fire. We'll do more than hope. We'll pray. Do you see anything yet, Francis? My eyes are weary from watching. At times, I, I think I can see, and then I realize it's just imagination. Look. Is that imagination? No. By heaven, you're right. Armistead has held them off. The flag is still there. A few days later, after the three enforced guests had been released from Admiral Coburn's flagship... Francis Scott Key was in his study when the door burst open and his two friends, Skinner and Dr. Beans, rushed in. Francis. Francis, look. See what they've done. Yes, it's wonderful, young man. You've done the country a service which the people can never forget. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, sit down. Uh, sit down, he says. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't sit down now if my life depended upon it. I, I, I'm thrilled. Well, what in the world are you talking about? Look. What? Why, it's my verse. Printed. Yes. I hope you won't be angry with me, Francis. But I showed your poem, the copy you made for me, to the editor of the newspaper. He had it printed, and thousands of copies of it have been distributed all over Baltimore. I'm highly honored, John. My thanks to you. Ah, but this is this is far greater than any of us can realize now, Mr. Key. What do you mean, Doctor? I mean simply this. There's not the slightest doubt in my mind but that this poem of yours will cement the faltering hopes of the people. You know how the public mind has been wavering as to the wisdom of this war. I... <laughs> I thought to do my share by my rash act a few days ago, but I was going about it with malice in my heart. You, young man, you have looked out over the bitter forces of this horrible war. You've scanned the horizon far above the hate of conflict and have seen a right. Francis Key, you have created the masterpiece which will inspire the American people to go on, to fight the war to the end, to strive with more vigor for the great final victory we must win. I didn't create this poem, gentlemen. It was born of the union of pity for those who have fallen and my innate love for my country. If the people can be brought closer together by it, I'm happy. I... I've not been able to enter the war actively, 
And if this can be of service, if the people will remember it, I, I shall be immeasurably happy. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light For so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming Whose cross stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly This is ChestertonRadio.com.